Rise and shine, everybody. It's time to wake and bake with Craig Reed and Griff Martin. Stone Brody Show, podcast number 226, Wake and Bake, the Morning Buzz, episode 103, action. Well, alrighty then, looky here, looky here, fellow earthlings, we got a special guest on our show today, Mike Sparks, who uh, started with the, the band during the rossington collins days but uh we'll let him tell that story about when that all started but uh yeah um this is uh monday it's september the 30th 2024 my name's craig reed aka the stone roadie also known in some circles as the most famous roadie that ever existed in the dawn since the dawn of time since the dinosaurs roamed this flat fat earth and with me today, as usually, my usual, my co-pilot, the rocket scientist, Griff Martin. And I'm just going to ask Griff just to take it over from here because uh, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. <laughs> and uh, let him just di dive in and start asking Mikey questions about this, that, and the other thing. So let's just take it away there, Griff. Okay, well, welcome, Mike Sparks. And to start with, how in the heck does somebody get a cool name like last name like Sparks? It's like uh, that's you know that's a name everybody would want. <laughs> it just worked out that way. But I uh, tell you, everybody calls me Mikey. So if you mention Mikey around Leonard Skinner, they know who you're talking about. And uh, I think Gary started calling me Mikey more than anybody. And uh, anyway, that's my name. Did you have anything to do with anything electrical? Well, you know, uh, I was in the Marines. After high school, I joined the Marines, 68 to 72, and I was uh, AT. I was an aviation electronics technician. So I could fix uh, Spark, electronic eh? stuff. Spark. And uh, when it came to playing the guitar, I played the guitar, electric guitar, and I could fix amps, I could fix guitars. And it worked out really good for me. Uh, but anyway, that's my name, and... I can fix amplifiers and make cables and do audio and all that stuff. I used to play in bands. And then uh, later on, when I got with the Skinners, you know, I became a roadie. But uh, that's pretty much it. So your name Sparks goes with your trade because you could fix stuff electrical. So that kind of worked out as a coincidence. Now, you you were in the uh, Marines with Artemis Pyle, weren't you? I sure was in uh Probably in 1968, November 1968, I was in uh, Millington, Tennessee, going to aviation electronics school, and Artemis was about six weeks ahead of me, and um, he had a bunk about three or four bunks over from mine, and I had a guitar. So I was playing the guitar one day, and he came over with his drumsticks, and we were talking about music and stuff, and he started drumming on the sticks while I was playing chords, and we were just goofing around and playing and playing. And we knew each other in Millington. Then about a year and a half later, we were stationed together in Beaufort, South Carolina at the Marine Corps Air Station. And he was uh, he was in one squadron and I was in another squadron. But uh, some guys said, hey, man, we're putting a band together. You want to play in a band? And I went over to where the band was. And Artemis was a drummer. And there were about four guys with uh, electric guitars. So... The next day, I went down to Savannah and bought me a bass guitar because I figured if they don't have a bass player, I can play bass and be in the band because they were pretty good guitar players. So I became the bass player, and we had a little band, and we played at the uh, Officers Club and the Enlisted Club and all the clubs around the, the bass there. And uh, we were playing Crosby, Stills, and Nash and Frank Zappa and, mm -hmm. and uh, just everything that was cool at the time, you know, and... Uh, so we played together and we both got out of the military at the same time. And we were both from Columbus, Ohio. Uh, that's where he graduated from high school and I graduated from high school. But he lived on the east side. I lived on the west side. And I was jamming with my buddies and he was playing with his buddies. So we really didn't 
play in a band together in Columbus, but we did go jam with each other occasionally. And eventually he left Ohio. He went to South Carolina, Spartanburg, South Carolina, where his wife was from. He met Marshall Tucker, introduced him to Charlie Daniels. Charlie said Skinner's looking for a drummer. He drove down to Atlanta at the old uh, Capri Ballroom, we called it. I think it's called the Coca-Cola, something or other, up in Buckhead. And he auditioned for Skinner, and he got the gig. He was the only one to audition for Skinner. Meanwhile, I was playing in bar bands. And about 1978, I left Ohio and went to Atlanta. And I ran into Artemis after the plane crash. And he said, hey, I'm putting a band together in South Carolina. And I was in a band in Atlanta, you know, a bar band, Ramada Inn kind of band. But I went over there and uh, joined his band and was playing. And he was just waiting on Skinner to get well because everybody was broken from the plane crash. So uh, it's weird, you know. Now, I'm, I kind of met the Skinners in late 78 and into 79, 1979. And uh, Artemis had a motorcycle wreck and broke his leg. And all the band guys have been healing for two years. And uh, actually, I met him in Orlando. This guy, Dorman Cogburn, was making an album, and he had Billy's brother playing bass, and Billy was playing piano, and Barry Harwood was playing guitar. And uh, Dorman was trying to get the Skinners to come down there. So Gary and Alan went down there, uh, Orlando, at BJ Studios. And, uh, you know, I was in the lounge, and Gary came in, and Alan came in, and I had this... Uh, um harmony guitar i bought for 35 dollars, and i was just sitting there playing it so i started playing hideaway which is a song on the john mayhall blues breakers album featuring eric clapton and alan looked at me and said man you're playing that wrong and he grabbed the guitar and he played it you know he played it like <laughs> note for note because alan could play man alan collins could play the guitar yeah. and gary took it from him and gary started playing something and i took the guitar from gary and i started playing all Your Love and Pretty Baby, which is another song off that album. These are blues standards, kind of. And I knew that one note for note. And then I thought, oh, cool. And he grabbed the guitar from me, and he sat there and played Crossroads, you know, which they recorded on the live at the Fox Theater. And Alan could play. Once again, I'm saying that. Gary took the guitar. I took the guitar, and I played, uh, I played some song like, uh, I forget what it was. And I knew that one really well. So in about... 15 or 20 minutes, I kind of guitar bonded with Gary and Alan. It's like really cool, you know, all of a sudden we could talk the same language musically. But uh, anyway, that album came out and, and that's when Gary and Alan said, why are we fooling with this album? Let's, let's, uh, let's go back to Jacksonville, and start working on our new album. And that's when they decided to get Barry Harwood because he was playing really well in Artemis's band, which was, the band we were using for the album for this guy, like I said, Dorman Cogburn was his name. And the album was Alias. And uh, JoJo was singing on it. You know, they were trying to get all the Skinner people on that album. But uh, anyway, uh, when the Skinners did get together, I was uh, Artemis was trying to play uh, at, at rehearsal, but his leg was so screwed up, he couldn't play, man. Because every after one song, he would have to stop, you know. So uh, he said, go on, guys. Go on and make your album. You're ready to go. And I hurt myself. And they got Derek Hess to play the drums. I drove a truck full of gear uh, from Asheville, North Carolina, down to uh, Jacksonville. And I just slept in the rehearsal house, which was Alan's garage, until Leon said, come on over and live with me. So I went over and started living with Leon in his house. And I just became a roadie. And I swear after about three or four weeks, Alan said, Hey man, are we paying you? And I said, no, I'm just here doing it, you know? And uh, they started paying me like 200 bucks a week, which was good for me because I didn't need any money really except for food. But anyway, Craig Reed, Taught me everything I know. He taught me how to string <laughs> guitars the right way. He taught me how to have a Skinner attitude, like we're the best band in the world and who the fuck are the Rolling Stones, you know, and uh, the attitude of the band, you know, and, and uh, you know, he taught me everything about, you know, the way we're going to do it. I knew if we went to a gig 
And Craig Reed was there. We were going to get the money and we were going to play and we were going to get the money and we were going to leave, you know. And uh, Craig had it together. He was the production manager. I became the stage manager and I was a guitar roadie. I could take care of the guitars and amps. But um, that's how I ended up with the Skinners. Well, going back, uh, Mike, all right, you guys, when you got out of the uh, Marines, you and uh, Artemis, and you guys, you stayed in touch, evidently, right? You uh, much- until he moved to South Carolina, I didn't know it. I was playing in bar bands, and here I, I, I heard that he was in Leonard Skinner. And I looked on the album cover, and sure enough, there he is on the railroad so track. what did you think about that when you saw Artemis Pyle? And, and did you know, I mean, was in your mind how popular – Skinner was at the time. Oh, I knew all about him. Uh, because so, that, I, so you were fans. I, yeah, I was a fan. I had to fan, play Sweet yeah. Home Alabama. I had to play uh, uh, On the Hunt. You know, I played a bunch of songs in bar bands. And so I when knew- you found out that Artemis was a drummer, that you had to probably go, "Damn, how the hell did that happen?" You know. Well, it, it's kind of kind of surreal. Things happen. Things so, happen. So then how did you end up, what did he call you up something and you and go, Hey man, get down here. I want you to meet these guys or. No, I was in, I was, I'd left Ohio and I was in Atlanta and actually I went to a music festival down in Piedmont park. And uh, man, I saw the Almond brothers there in 1970 at a shelter house. But anyway, I was down there. Uh, it was a, like a jazz festival or something. And I'm sitting there and I, I had joined a band and I was playing at Ramada Inns, you know, just bar band, band. And I don't even remember the people's names. You know, I met them, played in their band. But uh, I'm sitting there watching this band, and here comes Artemis traipsing through the crowd. Everyone's sitting down watching this band. It's a big crowd, like a couple thousand people. And here's Artemis traipsing through everybody. And I go, hey, there's Artemis. And I, you know, I went over and said, hey, man, what are you doing? And uh, that's when he said, Hey, I'm putting a band together over in Spartanburg, South Carolina. Why don't you come on over? And I said, well, I got to give these guys two weeks notice. I can't just quit the band. So a couple of weeks later, I drove over to South Carolina and started hanging with Artemis. And he had a bunch of musician friends and they had a band house. And uh, there was all kinds of people hanging out and different people were playing in the band. And uh, they were a pretty good band. Yeah. So, so when you knew him, when you guys got out of the Marines, he had short hair. And then when the next time you saw him, he was a full fledged uh, hippie, right? And you were. Well, I was too, though. <laughs> but <laughs> hey, the, it, Marines, when we were in the Marines, you know, Artemis was a sergeant, man. And, okay, yeah. And I was like a Lance Corporal, an E3, and he was an E5. But the reason he got rank, the reason he became a sergeant, he was squared away. He wore starchies. He has hair cut short. You know, he, oh, he looked yeah. apart. He looked apart, but he couldn't fix an airplane. You know, he couldn't. Oh, okay. His job was fixing airplane radios, and he really wasn't very good at that. But he was really good at being squared away, being a Marine. And they made him the recruitment uh, NCO. He sat in an office and signed guys up to stay in the military. You know, and, and he's, he got the, re- he's got the gift of gab, too, huh? Yeah, he's. Uh, a little, yeah, he, he can't, but he was just squared away and they like you being squared away. They don't like it. If you, you know, if you really don't care, you right. can still yeah. be a Marine, but he was squared away, but he was Sergeant Pyle in, uh, <laughs> Thomas Pyle. His name is Tom, Tom or Thomas Pyle, but we still called him Arvin, Artemis then. And, uh, so that you know, harmony, I, that harmony guitar yours, isn't that a Sears and Roebuck guitar? Well, it was a Harmony Catalina, and it was pink and black. And I bought it in Spartanburg, down at the music store down there, for thirty-five dollars. <laughs> and it was an inexpensive guitar. And because uh, I think that that's the guitar Gary learned to play on was a Harmony. He he might have. So when but you I, handed him that Harmony, he was right at home. Probably it had a big V neck on the back of it, it and that big, certainly didn't hurt when you get, uh, with you guys coming together with that instrument. But just just knowing those blues songs, because all all guitar players of that era knew so, all those songs. So you were playing a song, and Alan said, "Hold on, man, you ain't playing that right." And he grabbed it from you, and then he and then did he start shredding or what? Yeah, man. Well, the song was "Hideaway," and Freddie King wrote the song, but Eric Clapton covered it. And after Eric Clapton played it, everybody said Eric Clapton is God because. Well, 
Well, Mike, did, didn't you kind of like, I mean, you skipped over a couple things. I mean, didn't you like kind of pinch yourself knowing that you were sitting there playing with the two top guitar players of <laughs> Leonard Skinner? Didn't you kind of like go, damn, or did you just like blow it off? I mean, that had to be pretty cool. Well, they were just regular guys with long hair and, uh, you know. But the, uh, regular been, guys with, with some major hits and platinum albums. Well, we were we were playing in a band and we were playing and, and you know and they were they play and it's it's uh I didn't you know I didn't think of it that way but uh Alan was a, a really good guitar player and Gary's a very good guitar player you know for what he plays. Well, that's probably why they liked you because from what I understand you know, they didn't like all that starstruck shit. They were normal guys, you know, and if you kind of like just treated them like normal people and they liked you more that way too so. yeah they were they were straight up guys you know they were yeah. like, like craig and like uh everybody so you know? were basically just kind of hanging around and um and then helping them with stuff and then one day alan goes hey man are you getting paid he didn't even know if you were getting paid and then you said no and he said oh well we're gonna fix that well, they, they didn't have an organization. They didn't have management. They didn't have anything. They didn't have any money. They had their personal money, which is different than band money. Right, yeah. You know, when you Start work for now. a band and they're going to make an album, you don't get the money until the album's done. So they don't want to pay you until they get the money. But they or had the it, clout. They had yeah. the clout. Well, he started paying me out of his pocket. Yeah, when I when I, when I when they asked me to come to work for um, – Rostens and Collins, like I said, after I quit quit Journey and moved down there, I wasn't really on a, any kind of a salary. Yeah. yeah, there there wasn't no organization. I was just we weren't down getting paid there working, you know. But uh, yeah, yeah, not it not very easy. structured. Not like there a was regular nothing. Business. No, it was Gary and Alan. I mean, and they were trying to put a band together, and they didn't even like have Larkin. Yet. Larkin was kind of helping Alan with you know. So when when you met Barry Lee. He's a, now he's one damn good guitar player too. I mean, not just guitar; he plays anything, from what I understand. You he know? can play so, anything with strings on it. Yeah, very. You yeah. know, he lives he lives here in Hendersonville, where I live, and I've run into him a couple of times, and he's doing yeah. good. He's cool. he's more of a Christian artist. He he plays in churches yeah. and stuff like that. And yeah, he it, is a very really he's a really nice guy. I've got the chance to hang around him. Yeah, and he writes good songs. But he was playing in Artemis's band. And, you know, I was playing in Artemis's band on and off, and I was roadieing for him. And uh, Do you say Billy's brother was playing bass? Yeah. Yeah, I was at this um, uh, I was at this, this bar in Jacksonville. It was probably five years ago. And uh, I was helping Joe Crimp. I don't know if you ever met Joe Crimp. Um, yeah. Yeah, and uh, he, you know, setting his drums and stuff up and – and I was talking to this guy for I don't know, about 10, 15 minutes. And then Joe Crimp, he goes, you know, that's uh, Billy Powell's brother over there. And I was like, no way. And I didn't even know it, you know, that I was talking to Billy Powell's brother. And uh, then he got up and left. I ain't seen him since. But, uh, yeah, that was kind of. I can't cool. remember his first name. He was a good guy. Yeah, he was a real nice guy. But he didn't remind me too much. I mean, I could. Kind of see this resemblance in them. No, nah, they, didn't, they didn't look alike. He was kind of, you know, with a voice. <laughs> but um, Billy was unique, buddy. Yeah, he. You know, I'm Billy Powell. I play the piano. You know, that's <laughs> Billy Powell right there. And and he lets you know that he played the piano and he could play better than you. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So when you when you um got hooked up with him and you started, you said they started paying you. What you remember? Um, what so what was your what was your job exactly? Guitar roadie or do anything because I don't think we had a keyboard roadie. We didn't have a drum roadie. We didn't have anybody. It was just me and Mikey. Yeah. And okay. We, we, so Craig showed you the ropes and it was kind of do whatever you had to do. And, and that yeah. included driving the truck. Oh yeah. yeah. Me and Mikey, me and Mikey drove the truck well, for Alan Collins. It was just it, for Alan Collins. It was just me and Mikey. During yep. then, we we did those six shows. It was just us. So I guess that's just the way bands do. You know, they latch on to whoever's around that they think is a a positive influence or help to the band, and then they go, "Hey, this guy, he's going to be part of the organization here." And then they just 
you know, they go well, off, if you could, and off and running. If you could do the job, you know, and uh, that's all that counts. You did you find it? Did you find it pretty easy? I and mean, did you get along pretty good with everybody there, Mike? Oh, we got along great. Everybody got yeah. along great. It was hard work, though. And, um, uh, you do know, you remember your first gig? Yeah, it was one of those uh, great Southern music hall down there in uh, Orlando. They had a they had a place in Orlando and they had a place in Gainesville. And Craig, remember we had Sally Arnold. Uh, oh yeah, was our, Sally was yeah. our little road manager. Oh, Sally was there. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's lay down, Sally. We, you know? we had her on. We had her on the podcast. Yeah, I, I looked her up online, and she's a, she's in the breast cancer awareness yeah. or something like that. And yeah. Uh, yeah, she sent us book. She she got a book, uh, the Rock and yeah. Roll Manny. There's yeah, a book we're, right we're there. Book. Yeah, she was pretty cool. But uh, yeah, the, the first gig was down at uh, probably Orlando, Great Southern Music Hall. And we did sat Friday night and Saturday night. We did two shows. And then we went up to Gainesville the next weekend and did uh, the Great Southern Music Hall. We did two shows on Friday and two shows on Saturday. And then about a, two weeks later, we went to the Superdome <laughs> and did a show. Uh, yeah, that was a crazy show, wasn't it? Yeah, man. Uh, Dickie Bass was down in the dressing room, Nitty Whoa. Gritty Dirt Band. Willie Nelson was a headliner and... And uh, well, that first was, show, Mike, well, that first show had to be like the people were probably dying to see that. It had to be a hit. Well, well yeah, of crazy. course, it was, it was like controlled pandemonium. Yeah. Every I mean, time the band played, I mean, I mean you like, got these guys from Leonard Skinner back on stage now, and that, that was, that had to be like a pretty, pretty a good show. Oh, it show. was wide open, man. It was like every second something was going on. Did it like, go off pretty good? Was it pretty professional? You guys have a great result with it? Uh, yeah, it went good. It went from start to finish, and uh, you know the crowd went crazy on Freebird, of course. How Mikey many? And I were reminiscing uh, the other night when I called talking to Mikey, and he was he was uh, going, went back to Homedale, New Jersey, when they when the they ripped the four three or four rows of seats out of the front row during Garden three, State three, Arts around. Center. It, it was crazy. They were they were standing on the seats, and they ripped the first three rows of seats out, and they were up on the stage. And they climbed over the PA. They climbed up the front <laughs> of the PA and jumped down. And they were all around the, the edges of the stage. And we were kind of like, hey, y'all chill out. Just stand right here. And they're like, okay, cool. And they stayed off the stage, but there was 100 people all around us. Why know? did they rip the seats? Why did they do that? Because they Freebird were standing on the seats, uh, standing on the seats oh, and, and jumping up and down on them. And they actually collapsed, the, ripped them right out of the concrete. Three and rows. All, oh, yeah, yeah, all the people in the back. There were so many the of them. There wasn't just three rows of people. There was 20 rows of people in the first three rows. Oh, man. Well, <laughs> well if anybody's listening, crazy. if anybody's listening and you were there in the comments, let, let us hear from from you well the, hey there was a full moon too you could see the full moon <laughs> and even the t-shirt guy said when the crowd was leaving they just tore down the fence and left they didn't go out the exit you know <laughs> they just tore down the fence and left and uh, <laughs> at freebird man that'll, that'll get well they were on. enjoying it then they were enjoying oh, it yeah. was crazy it. so it was all good the singer what did you think of the singer uh dale yeah, I mean, no, I mean, didn't you have like, uh, it started off, would it start off with Dale? Actually, with Ross and the Collins, there was no singer. They were looking for a singer. Yeah, that's, I was. And uh, the band was playing the songs, but we didn't have a singer. And the guys were thinking about, well, are we going to get Leslie West? Or are we going to get. Yeah, that's because you were Paul there. Rogers, that we're going to get somebody. And Artemis wanted this friend of his to sing. Uh, actually, his name was Poet. He was a black guy. And they said, oh, I don't think that's going to work for us because they, they didn't want to do Leonard Skinner songs. They wanted to do all new stuff because yeah. Judy didn't want him to do Leonard Skinner. And they weren't, they were, you know, they said they weren't going to do Leonard Skinner when they were in the hospital under the influence of drugs. They said, we're not going to do Leonard Skinner anymore. So they you wanted were ready to contact Paul, uh, uh, Lou Graham from Foreigner and see if he would yeah. do it. And I said, "Man, he's not going to quit Foreigner to come with you guys." Yeah. And then they and then they wanted uh, to get a hold of uh, Paul Rogers. 
Yeah. And we tried that to get the guy. Him. There was a they wanted there and then there was a Greg Allman. I think that they were thinking about him and he wanted to do the Greg Allman thing, you know, before that. But he would have done it. He would have actually done it though, you think? Greg Allman? I th I think he would have, but they would they he wanted to be wanted to be the headliner and not them. And they they you know, they wanted to do something. They just couldn't use the Skinner name. You know, but they, you know, they didn't. So they didn't know. Wow. And they so. didn't. They didn't want to play the songs, man. They oh. wanted. They just wanted to do new yeah. songs. So when Dale came along and she came over, and you know, Alan called her one wailing bitch. You know, that's what he called her. Yeah, yeah. And, she uh, did a good job of writing the writing those songs for those two first albums. She did great, man. Yeah, she jumped. And me right and in. Mikey, me and Mikey w w were the ones that rode drove the equipment truck out to El Paso, Texas, El, D El Adobe Studios out there, and it was right across the border was Mexico. Yeah, we went to uh, we went to Studio One and tried to record and the and the producer said hey you guys aren't ready and we're like we already played five or six gigs he said these songs aren't ready to record so rodney what's his name rodney mills mm -hmm. and we left studio one and uh, we loaded up a the band van we had a white dodge van we loaded that thing where you couldn't get anything else in it and then we had a trailer with the uh it was an open trailer with the b3 leslie's and the piano and we drove from Jacksonville, Florida to El Paso, Texas. And uh, it was so cool. We got we get to El Paso. The trip in itself was something else. Going <laughs> going across Texas when there was a gas shortage. And it was hard getting gas, you know. And we get to El Paso. And Craig, right here, he goes right down to the border, to the nearest restaurant to the border. And we go in and eat, man. And it was the greatest Mexican. And we went to that place like every other day when we were in the <laughs> studio. <laughs> and, uh, it was El, Ado El Adobe Studios, uh -huh. and uh, 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 the studio owner had a friend from L.A. who came over and helped the band produce the record, you know, and it was, uh, we made the record there. Then we went to Miami and mastered it, and that, that was some crazy times, going to Miami, 1980, you know, it was like, it was like Miami Vice before Miami Vice was on TV, man, it was a, uh, it was a wild scene in Miami. I can tell you that. Well, uh, Mike, I got to ask you something, being how, I mean, you were there. Craig doesn't remember this, but I saw an interview. It was with John Cougar Mellencamp, and he kept talking about how he would go into that studio down there in Miami, and this crazy son of a bitch, Alan Collins, wanted to fight him all the time. <laughs> did you know any, did you have see anything of that? Because Craig no. doesn't remember it. I, I don't I don't remember, but Journey, you know, the singer for Journey was in one room. James Brown was recording it in another room. He was he was a hoot, man. He had oh, his yeah. band. He cool. had his band in there. They played that song about 30 times, Living in America or something like that. And he came out and he's all sweaty in the hallway. And he goes, <laughs> I think them boys are gonna learn the song in a minute. And he goes back in. But um uh, Julio Iglesias was yeah. doing vocals right and this guy he had the music all done and every day he would come in and sing in a different language he was singing portuguese and he was singing spanish and he was singing english wow. doing the same songs but he had bags full of mail we didn't even know who he was you know and he was like the biggest uh latin artist in the world man and he'd come come up every day he'd drive a jaguar one day and he'd have a rolls royce the next day and he'd have a mercedes the next day and uh, his wife would be sitting there reading fashion magazines, you know, like in the lounge, and his girlfriend would be sitting next to her. <laughs> you know, it's that kind of thing with the Latin artists, you know. But wow. uh, I don't remember John Cougar Mellencamp, but uh, yeah, you know, we were really wide open in Miami. I mean, it was you can imagine Miami in 1980. It was yeah, the Bee Gees are from Miami. There's a lot yeah, of people were. that lived down there. Yeah. yeah, that was the studio they were using. Was like Somebody had told me that they had some of the equipment, the original Muscle Shoals equipment down there they were using for a soundboard or something. Um, probably. probably. Yeah, but that, that's quite a few artists that you got to meet while you were there, huh? Oh, that was in one day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, there would be other people coming in and out, you know, uh, overdubbing and cutting tracks or mixing stuff. But... Uh, 
How long were you guys there recording? Uh, we recorded in El, uh, El Paso, but we mixed it. But uh, they did overdubs and stuff there. We were there probably two or three weeks, and then we'd go away and come back for another two weeks, and then the album was done. What's the scene like in the recording studio while those guys are what, – what all kind of stuff do you have to do as far as a, uh, as a roadie when they're recording? Just uh, be there and have everything ready. And I would just, just be doing my guitar thing, and uh, it depended on what they were working on at the time. Was and, it was it a lot easier than doing a concert? Would you say? Uh, just no. different. Just different. Concert. Yeah. <laughs> a concert is like singing the national anthem. After you get started, you go through it completely. You know, you just do it. We're in the studio. You could slam on the brakes and stop and have to do something else. Oh, okay. All the time, or something's not working out, or you know, you never know about studio work. And it's a lot of sitting around doing nothing for for the roadies a lot of times. Yeah. You know. But it was just you and Craig though, right? Pretty much most of the time. Do you remember Dale sitting in the front room, front uh, part of the studio with the typewriter typing? I went and bought her that typewriter and she sat in there and typed all those songs. Yeah, she songs. wrote Tashana and El Adobe, you know, there in uh, Three Times as Bad with Alan. That was a good song, man. You know, that blues song, Three Times as Bad. I don't mm -hmm. know if you remember it. Oh, but, yeah. Uh, yeah, she worked hard, man. Yeah, uh, Craig says she's an excellent writer. Excellent. Yep. She did I good. She so. wrote all those stuff. You know, Get Away, she wrote Don't Misunderstand. Oh, Get Away, what a good song. I, I like yeah. that. You know, a lot of a lot of it, you hear it so much and you're so into it, you don't even like listening to it, you know, but a lot of the songs are really good. I love the Skinner songs. Today, I can listen to Freebird every day, you know, no problem. <laughs> the fast part, the slow part <laughs> kind of, you know, puts me to sleep. Well, okay. how did they do Free Bird without Ronnie? Well, Leonard Skinner plays note for note. Okay. I mean, they don't singer, jam. singer they don't wide, pull around. You know? They don't pull a bunch of extra junk in there. They don't do anything. So they who play was, everything exactly the way it's supposed to be played. Who was singing Ronnie's part? You don't have to sing it. You can still play it note for note. You just didn't do that part. It was just an it's instrumental. It's implied, you know. Okay. People yes. are singing it in their head. Their fans already know it. You don't have to sing it because, to them. yeah, because the tribute band did that too, up to did a point, you know. And yeah. finally, they made Johnny sing it. Yeah, and with the okay of uh, Lacey, I think finally was my. Well, you, you, so you heard you heard Freebird before you even met Alan, and then you got to see him play that shit. Yeah, that's that had to be pretty damn cool, right there. Oh, really? Well, Alan. You know, when Alan's playing Freebird, he kind of goes somewhere else in his head. You know, I mean, w when you're deep into playing like that, he's right. like, he's somewhere else, you know, and he puts it out and he puts it out. And he continues to put it out. And, you know, and uh, it's funny when he gets done with it, you know, with the last dump, he kind of looks around like, where am I? What's everybody doing? <laughs> you know? It's kind of like he's coming out of a trance. Yeah. Do you remember that when he'd play that Tarzan lick? Da, 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 da. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Alan could play, man. That's, and and like I said, Gary can play, Barry Harwood can play. But Leon was the best musician of them all, I think. I love <laughs> Leon's bass playing, and Leon yeah. was so good, man. And Leon. I, I can't say enough good things about Leon, even though he was Leon. He was like, uh, he's like Pigpen. And you lived with Leon then, Yeah, right? I sure did. Out there at the church, yeah, at the mansion, yeah. Yeah, you know, I went out to the mansion and I videotaped it, and, and I was hoping I could run into somebody that would come outside and I could have a chat with him. But what was that like living over there, uh, Mike? Well, it's miles away from everywhere, but Leon would go out, and at two o'clock, the party would come to the house. <laughs> I mean, the party would come to the house at two o'clock. So I'd, I'd be at home and I'd go, well, I'm going to take a nap at, at 10 o'clock until one o'clock because I knew it was going to be a party at two o'clock. Oh, yeah. And uh, it was always you didn't have to go out looking for babes because Leon would bring them all home. Did he go to the bar and bring the bar home? <laughs> yeah, that's the way it was. 
but and he, he ran through some wives. I think he had five wives, and uh, we he called them the Omen, Omen One, Omen Three, Omen Five. <laughs> and they all left with a car and a horse trailer and a horse and a house and a you know they all took Leon's money. But uh, <clears throat> and Leon, like I said, it was a great musician. And when it when he put his guitar on, man, Leon could play. And you didn't have to tell Leon about anything. You didn't have to tell him how to play anything when they were writing songs. He knew what to play. And he wasn't playing your your bass guitar root note thing. I mean, he was, he could really play, you know, and uh, I really enjoyed being around Leon. He was so funny, so funny, so many different times. He'd be on stage playing and run, run off one of the risers and trip and fall on the stairs and fall flat on his face on the stage. And he'd be running and fall down and sliding on his stomach on his guitar. And he'd look at me and he'd be holding the neck up. And he'd go, look, I didn't knock it out of tune, you know, <laughs> while he's falling down. And then he'd get up. Or Leon Leon would put on a, a, a wife beater T-shirt, right? And he put on a T-shirt. Then he put on a long sleeve T-shirt. Then he put on a vest. Then he put on a regular shirt. Then he put a jacket on. Then he put an overcoat on. And then he started the show with a fireman's coat on and a fireman's hat, like a big <laughs> one. And he'd come out and play the first song and come over and take his hat off and put his sunglasses on, play the second song, come over, take his fireman's coat off and get another guitar and play. And after the fourth song, he'd take his jacket off. And as the show went along, he would take his clothes off for a different look and put on different glasses, wow. different hat. You know what I'm talking about, Craig. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, we yeah. Had a he had a different had a table hat with like 20 hats. And sunglasses, yeah. and Leon would be playing, uh, you know, and change. For Freebird, we had glasses with lights, so that when the lights went out, he could still see his fretboard, you know, <laughs> because the lights would go out right when he was playing his solo. But uh, and people don't realize in Freebird, the solo before the jump, which is halfway through the fast part of Freebird. Alan's really resting. He's just going and 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 and. It's like a drummer playing on the snare when he's going. Da -da 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 -da. Well, he's resting his arms because he's been hitting these cymbals and his arms are tired. So he comes down on the snare. But <laughs> Leon would be playing lead break. Leon is playing the lead break for the jump. He's going, do -do 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 you know, right, so he has yeah. to see what he's doing. And then the jump, boom, and the lights come back on. Dun -dun 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 you know, and that goes back to Alan playing stuff. But uh, Leon, you know, he was he was the, the foundation behind these guys. And he knew every song every time and everything. But he was a pig pen. He would start to show off. He'd have to have a, a, a throat lozenges, you know, in his throat. And he would light a cigarette and he'd be playing. And after one song, he had already slobbered on his guitar and got cigarette ashes on him and it was just a mess, you know, and you give him another guitar. You'd have to clean his guitar off because Leon was just a mess. Was he a pig pen at the house too, Mike? No, he was just a normal person, but he would wear the same clothes for three or four days in a row. And <laughs> Craig would tell him, Leon, you got to change your clothes every now and then. You can't just... And he was sleeping in too. You know what I mean? On the road. <laughs> and uh... Did you witness any of him collecting his hats? Oh, he would just get them. People throw them to him, give them to him. He just got them wherever he got them. So well, I, I guess because people knew Leon liked hats, that's how he got a lot of his hats. From yeah, people, people would bring them and give them to him, him, and he would wear them. Yeah. So, uh, what you got? Any like a good story of living with Leon? Anything you can tell us that was really cool that happened when you were living with Leon? Something. Uh, just normal day to day, Leon. He was so funny yeah. and just fun, you know. Did he did he stay like high all the time or <gasps> what, what was he what was it like around no, there? Leon would never go over where he wasn't in charge of himself, except one time we were playing, I think it was in Nashville at the amphitheater, and his stupid wife, Omen four or five, crazy woman, you know, on the road the guys would have a drink here and have a drink there and get ready for the show and go out and drink during the show. And they, they had their, their routines, you know, well, she showed up and gives him a couple extra volumes or whatever, you know, and he's drinking. Well, like we get to 
we get to uh, Call Me the Breeze, which is the next to last song. It's the song before Sweet Home Alabama. And then they go off stage and come back on and do the encore Freebird. And he was playing Mr. Breeze. And all of a sudden he's standing there and he's not playing. So I went out and I go, Leon, what are you doing? And I could see his eyes. He was not there. He had passed out standing up, <laughs> oh. playing. <laughs> and I drug him behind the amp line a little bit to throw water in his face and put a towel on him, you know. And uh, I thought, well, heck, I can just take the guitar and I can stand behind the amps and play. Call me the breeze, you know, because it's a real basic song, you know. But uh, he kind of woke up a little bit and he looks at me and I said, Leon, you're playing Mr. Breeze in the key of A. And he looked and he went, yeah. oh, OK. And then turn around and walk back on stage, you know. But that was because of his dumb wife giving him Valiums or something, you know. But uh, that's and Leon, you know, in the plane crash, he lost a kidney. And sometimes in the middle of the set, he'd have to take a piss, man. See, and, I, I didn't know that he lost a kidney in the plane. Oh, crash. Leon, he had all of his internal organs shoved up under his chest, man. Leon almost died. Yeah, I mean, they I all almost that. died. But I didn't know he lost a kidney. That's 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 an exclusive here on the he, Stone he was, Show. He had abdominal injuries, uh, really bad. But uh, so he, we'd have to get a big cup or something behind the amp line. He'd be playing and walking around behind the amps and take a piss during the show, you know. <laughs> Somebody told to... me that, like, if you were at a bar somewhere and Leon was there and he turned around and he'd be missing, and then somebody would say, where's Leon? And then he's gone, and then they would find him in some neighborhood at somebody's house watching football. Well, I can believe that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, he, he loved he everybody. Know, he didn't know these people, and he was in their house, and – and he was getting his beers out of the refrigerator and watching football, and he just met them. <laughs> it's like it's like one one time we were flying to Japan, and uh, it's a, it's a, it could be a long story, but I, we got on the airplane and we've been touring a lot, and because I was the stage manager, the band would listen to me because before the show I'd go, "You guys stand right here, don't walk away. We're going to start the show in one minute. We're getting ready." You know, the road manager brought the band. Big Lou or whoever, Paul Abrams, would bring the band to the stage. I made sure the stage was ready to go. And I'd go down there and say, don't wander off, because they'd wander off and talk to the crowd, or they'd wander off to the bathroom or something. And i go, look, you son of a bitch, or, you know, whatever. <laughs> stay right here. And they would stay right there. And I'd go, make sure everything's ready to go. And i go, we're going to start the show. House lights down. You know, and they'd run up on the stage. So we were getting on an airplane at 747, to fly to Japan and they got on the plane and they were in first class and I was supposed to walk through and go sit in the back with uh, Craig and everybody. And I started walking through and Leon and Billy were fooling around in first class. And I said, Hey man, quit fucking around. These people don't want to hear your shit. Just sit down, put your seatbelt on. And the stewardess saw me say that. And she stopped me. She goes, would you like to sit up front here with these guys? Because she, she realized they would do what I told them, right? Because oh, yeah. they'd been drinking on the airplanes. They always drink on the airplanes. And I said, yeah. So I got to fly to Japan, first class, in the front of a 747, eating sushi and Godiva chocolates and champagne, you know. And so we get to Japan, and we get off the airplane, and they give me a bottle of champagne and a box of Godiva chocolates for helping them take care of the band. The animals. And Leon is wearing a... a a blanket around him, right? And he's trying to hide something. So we're going through customs and he's trying to hide something. And they're like, what's wrong? What's wrong? What's wrong? You know? And what what happened was he had pissed on himself sitting there on the airplane. Oh wow, yeah. You know, and he didn't want to show everybody he peed his pants. So I walked over with him. We said, hey, he peed his pants. He was just trying to hide that. He wasn't trying to smuggle marijuana into Japan, which you cannot yeah. do. I can tell you that. Oh yeah. They don't like that over there. That's uh Paul McCartney had that problem. Yeah. But I'll tell you what, when Leonard Skinner was in Japan, the hell's angels and Leonard Skinner came to our show and gave us a little bit of marijuana. Oh yeah. It, yeah. And then the smoking, I'm just saying you had to take a tube of toothpaste, empty the toothpaste out, stick a, uh, like a, um, a ballpoint pen in the end of it. The, the shaft on the ballpoint pen, and you could put it in there and roll your window, uh, get your window at your hotel and smoke it out. 
<laughs> and it was, it was a process. It was terrible. It was terrible. But the Hell's Angels brought a little bit of marijuana to Leonard Skinner. What the? Japan. Where was that? What the hell were they doing there? They have a chapter there in Tokyo. Oh, really? I yeah. didn't know that. that was crazy. <laughs> they got everything in Japan, I'll tell you that. So did but, you take Sally Arnold's place? No, she was the road manager. Oh, I was okay. a stage manager. Gotcha. But she finally quit, though, didn't she? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, he, I think Alan kind of freaked her out. He was shooting a rifle in the house or something, huh? Well, yeah. Were you there well, for that? You know, I'm, I'm going to tell you what the problem was. Uh, Sally Arnold, they put her in a condo, and uh, and she was getting cases of or and she was buying food. She was buying this because she didn't have a green card. They couldn't pay her. So instead of paying her, she would just get what she wanted and charge it to the band. And she wasn't over the top, you know, she needed to eat. And then they go, then Larkin or somebody, Alan's dad or somebody said, Oh, she's just mooching off you guys. And they didn't realize they weren't paying her. And she was taking her payment just in charging it to the band, you know, she was surviving the only way she knew for how. a rental car for, you know, to live right. in America. And they thought she was trying to screw them and they confronted her about it. And she wasn't going to put up with that shit. She said, well, I'm out of here. And uh, she went ahead and left. And it, it was just, you know, it wasn't right. What happened to Sally, but uh, it all turned out good. That's the way rock and roll is, you know? Yeah. But, you know, see, the road manager, the tour manager takes care of the tours, the buses and the trucks and pays everybody and does everything. And if a show's canceled, he tells everybody we're going to the next show. The road manager takes care of the band. He's got the band at the hotel. He brings them to the gig. He takes care of them. He brings them to the stage. The stage manager takes care of them on the stage. When they walk down the stairs off the stage, the road manager takes them away where Craig and who was doing production and I was doing stage management, we have to get the gear and stuff out. And that's the way things work. The road manager brings the band to the stage. You take care of them at the stage. They get off the stage. They go with the road manager. But also we worked with them in the studio and the rehearsal. We didn't, some people are just paid to go on the road and that's it. But Craig and I work with them, you know, 24 well, seven. Craig, didn't you say the drugs were a little bit worse with uh, Rossington Collins than they were with Skinner, and then with the Allen Collins, it was it, way... it, it, it consistently got worse. Yeah. 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 So, uh, how was it with the drugs, Mike? As far as that went, what did you see? Well, I don't drink, and I never drink, and they all drank. You know, so I whiskey. drove whiskey with Coca Cola or Billy Tangray. You know, gin. Yeah. Oh, that tangerine is bad. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, you know, people drink what they want to drink. And I didn't drink. So that was a good thing. Yeah. That and, kept them straight, kind of. And the drug, and I didn't have enough money to have a problem with drugs. But uh, there was always, you know, we'll just say it, cocaine was around everywhere and everybody was doing it, kind of. And uh, I finally decided not to do it. It was like I gave up on it. We even, there was a time where people were smoking bass, you know, and that really sucked and everybody decided we're not going to do this anymore because that was super shitty doing bass which is the stupidest thing in the world but uh and we all smoke pot everybody smoked pot and that was just you know recreational with the beer mm -hmm. and stuff but uh by the time i got to alan collins band it was totally out of control you know and even Ross and the Collins, you know, I thought I thought we had it pretty bad, but we were still doing gigs and everything was going good enough. I mean, you know, it wasn't really interfering. But I'll tell you what, we played a gig one time and, and the Joe Perry Project, you know, Joe Perry had played with uh, Aerosmith. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Aerosmith, Aerosmith yeah. course, and those guys were worse than we are, man. Hey, they, was they, he, they was Joe Perry a short little guy? Yeah, he was. That's what somebody player. told He's, me. He was like a midget. We were going to have the roadie band play and they showed up at the last second. We didn't think they were going to show up, so we had a roadie band that was going to play in front of them, and I had it arranged so what they were the roadie band was going to get the money, and then yeah. they showed up at the last second. <laughs> and those those guys played. I guess they were all right. I didn't listen to them, but when they got done, they couldn't even get their junk off the stage. They were too, <laughs> they were too screwed up to realize to get their stuff off the stage. We had a get the stagehands and get their junk off the stage and put it in a pile over in the corner. 
You know, <laughs> they were worse than we were. But <laughs> at least we did our gigs all the way through. Most of them, every, every now and then, probably one out of fifty gigs or one out of seventy-five gigs, Alan would blow a fuse. Especially after Kathy died, you know, he was susceptible. What what, what did that consist of? What do you mean, blow a fuse? What happened in the middle of the show? He would go, "Why am I here? Why am I doing this?" You mean with Alan Collins' band? Yeah, no, with even at the, a couple of Rossington Collins gigs. Well, Dale drinking. and Gary, Dale and Gary canceled a lot of shows, but and, but she he, died during the Alan Collins, right? Yes, she did. I can Not tell that, you everything yeah, about that. Yeah, and I want to get to that too. As far as um the the drugs, was Alan the worst? You'd say no. <laughs> oh, the, everybody was worse. Everybody <laughs> was equally worse. I yeah, think I mean, Alan some was people the could. Worst. I some think people Alan could, was the worst. I, Alan was probably the worst. Uh, but he was know, shooting up, and what Leon, happened? Leon, I don't think Leon ever shot up. If he did, it was only a couple. Well, of I times. don't like to Alan talk about did. the guys and what they did. Alan, after Kathy died, he, he was hanging out with some bad, bad people in Jacksonville, and he was, yeah, he might have been sticking a needle in his arm occasionally. Well, how All did the they? Time, when he blew day. the fuse, what? When he blew the fuse, what happened? Did they just walk off the stage? Or? No, he throw his guitar in the crowd, or he throw it on the ground and try to leave. And you oh, go yeah. over, go, Alan, what are you doing? We got to finish this show and get paid. You know, for me, it was like, let's finish the show and get paid. So you, you had know, to run out in the crowd and grab his guitar back? I have. <laughs> you don't run out in the crowd. You you jump into the crowd. <laughs> I, I jumped in the crowd one time. <coughs> Dale Kranz was telling me about it. She, she watched me do it. But he threw his guitar in the crowd. And it's a guitar I had bought for him. Uh, I mean, I used his money, but I bought it down in Miami. It was double cutaway, Les Paul special. But uh, he threw it out in the crowd, and I went to the front of the stage just to look to see where it was. And I saw these people had it, so I dove like head first down and grabbed it. And I had people pulling my hair one way and pulling my hair the other way and pulling my arm here, and I'm holding the guitar and stuff. And I finally got it, and got back on the stage. And about three months later. We get a lawsuit where they said I broke somebody's arm jumping in the crowd. They had to pay somebody seventy thousand dollars. Really? Because because uh, I jumped in the crowd, it was, we were liable because of what I did. But uh, I didn't have to pay it. But the band paid the guy's medical bills. And another time, he he threw a strat out there, and I went out and got it. And how did the guitar, explore... guitar fare? Did it? Did the guitars break, or were they okay? Or we've had a couple broken guitars. I think Craig knocked over a guitar, Barry Harwood's little SG one time, accidentally, and uh, broke the headstock on it. And uh, Alan jumped up in the air one time and hit Billy's piano. He was playing a Stratocaster, and the jack hit, and it, it broke the jack plate out of the guitar. So the, the guitar was still plugged in, but the jack plate was tore out of the guitar. And he came back. He said, plug me in. I said, man, there's no jack plate. I had to give him another guitar, you know, oh, and fix wow. it the next day. And... Uh, he he's broke broke the headstock on a, a double cutaway Les Paul special, the the tobacco sunburst one. That's why I had to buy the other one for him. And uh, and Gary, you know, Gary's had a Les Paul or two with the necks broken on him. So when now, they threw the guitars out there, you go get them and you get them back on stage and they start playing again, or did they just quit? Well, in Alan's case, you know, he tried to run off stage and then he came back on after one song and another time he left and didn't come back. He went out walking around out in the crowd. I mean, he just, he wasn't going to do it, man. No doubt, huh? That's all there was. <laughs> and without did, a, did people raise hell about that? You know, yeah, which, when the crowd comes, they don't care about the gig. They care about hearing Freebird, man. That's they want right. to hear Freebird. They come oh, there okay. for their Freebird. That's all they want is their Freebird. That's oh, what. Okay. And when Freebird's over, they know it's over. What song you know? is it you want to hear? Yeah. You know, and uh, <laughs> it's it's funny. You know, and as soon as it's over, they know it's over, and they're like, "Thank you, thank you, thank you for playing that song for me." Yeah, but, that's uh, the one thing I guess did. Did they run off the stage and come do the encore with Freebird and they didn't do an encore? Yeah, if what they did was they played Sweet Home Alabama. When Sweet Home Alabama was over with, they'd walk off the stage, okay? 
they don't run back on the stage. They go to the dressing room. They smoke a cigarette and they take a piss. And it takes about five or six minutes every time. You know, they're not one of those run off the stage, run back on the stage. They go down to the dressing room and they have a cigarette. And if somebody goes, hey, man, you better get back out there. There's going to be a riot. And they're like, welcome. If they want to hear Freebird, they can leave. Okay. We're going to come out here and play that after we take a little five minute break here. And then they come back out and, but the crowds are really funny. Sometimes they're yelling for the band to come out and they get a big crescendo and then it dies down. And then it's kind of like a murmuring, like well, these motherfuckers better come out. You know, it's, oh, this yeah, is the crowd. Right. This is 10,000, 12,000 people. Yeah. And then it gets quiet again. And then they start demanding, 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 start yelling free bird and stuff, demanding. And then it starts calming down again and they're kind of going, Oh man, are they going to do it? And then they come on stage. It's a big cheer and they, they go out and do it. That was in Ron Eckerman's book. When he was a promoter rep, he was talking about the band went into the dressing room and then the crowd was about to go crazy. And he had to go back and and make sure they were coming out. And just as he got to the dressing room, they busted through the door and, and, and pasted him to the wall. It's like, get out of the way. We're going up there, okay? Get out of the way. We're, we're going to go You know, I remember them in Lakeland, and it took them a while to come back out to do Freebird. Yeah, it's I remember. They, were, by, they were stomping, and they were out stomping on the floor. Boom, 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 you know? And then and it was like seemed like it was forever. Yeah, it did. That's the mystique of that that whole uh, the whole setup, you know? it's It's part of making them want it, want it, want it, and then giving it to them, you know. You know, in the middle of Freebird, we have a mirror ball cue. And, uh, you know, this is I'm talking about the fast part of Freebird. Halfway through it is where the jump is. That's when Alan jumps, everybody jumps up in the air. Then halfway to the ending, we have the mirror ball cue. And the mirror ball cue means that the lights go out. And because the crowd's getting kind of tired of Freebird, after the jump, here we're going to do it again kind of thing, right? And then it's like, the well, crowd's kind of getting, is when's this going to end kind of thing? Well, the mirror ball cue, the lights go out, spotlights hit the mirror ball, which is moving around in circles. And if it's a really dark arena, man, it goes off. That's a good gag because you get disoriented from the mirror ball. I mean, uh, it's a really good gag. And then after uh, 32 bars right there, the lights come back on and we get into the ending and then the crowd's all into it again. They're ready for the big ending, which is a big thing in itself, which I really miss if people play Freebird and they cut off the ending. It sucks, okay, to me, because I love the live ending. But uh, for a while, instead of the mirror ball cue, we would, we would turn the house lights on. So the band's playing and playing and playing, and all of a sudden the lights go out and the house lights come on. It's like the end of the show. It's like the cops are trying to stop the show. You know what I mean? Oh, that's like, hey, them stop, off. Stop. And, and the lights are out, and it's like the crowd's going, what's going on, what's going on, what's going on? Well, then the house lights go off, and the stage lights come back on for the ending. And it's kind of like, it's just a gag. But oh, okay. It, 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 it okay. surprised, it, it, it's, you know, when they talk about show business being smoke and mirrors, you know? That's, yeah, that's the mirror ball like cue, they have smoke generated, and they have a mirror ball. So it's all smoke and mirrors after this big two-hour show. You get your free bird that you wanted. Right in the middle of it, they give you the smoke and mirrors, you know, and then they give you the ending. So it's it's pure uh, entertainment, traditional uh, show business, man. It's, it's just the way the show evolved. I didn't have anything to do with making that work like that. It's like the intro is the same thing. You know, the house lights are on, the house music's playing, the band's getting ready to play, and we were using uh, uh, All Along the Watchtower by Jimi Hendrix. All of a sudden, when you heard All Along the Watchtower, you had two minutes and five seconds to get your shit together because the show's going to start. Well, the crowd doesn't know that. They just know Jimi Hendrix is on, and then the sound guy would make it louder and louder. <laughs> yes, Leon and Leon. <laughs> they, anyway... It, all of a sudden, Jimi Hendrix along the Watchtower would be getting louder and louder, and, and the crowd could tell something's happening, okay? And at the end of that, the house lights would go off, and the crowd would cheer. The band would run on the stage. The crowd would cheer. 
and they would start playing, uh, uh, working for MCA, which comes in on a one. It's like a James Brown song. Boom. I feel good. Do, 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 do. Boom. You know, working for MCA is boom. Dun, 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 dun. So they play working for MCA. At the end of MCA, they go, dun, big ending. Dun, 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 dump. Gary would spin around and go, dun, 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 start playing I Ain't the One. They play I Ain't the One. So you've been manipulated from Jimi Hendrix to the start of the show to working for MCA, I Ain't the One, it, which has a big ending. When that ended, boom, crowd would cheer. Johnny would go, hey. He'd go, hey, how you doing? And they're already 20 minutes into the show before they even say, how you doing? <laughs> you know, and so they manipulated the crowd and the whole the whole show worked like that. But anyway, didn't mean to go off on a tangent there. So, some of the <clears throat> some of go the ahead. opening acts that got any uh, anything you can share with us about some of the opening acts, anything. Well, uh, Jackal maybe? got thrown off. Who? Jackal. Oh, well, Jackal. You know, <laughs> Jackal. Yeah. yeah. We we clean the stage. We'd vacuum the stage, get it all nice and clean. Jackal go out there with a chainsaw, cut up shit and have sawdust and pieces of wood and shit all over the stage. And we'd go, hey, you got to clean that up if you're going to do that. Or Jackal would talk bad about the audience. And they'd go, oh, you stupid fucks come to see Leonard Skinner. We're going to show you how to rock and roll. Leonard Skinner ain't shit. You, know? you can't do that with Skinner. <laughs> and Dale went out front. It was at the front of the house and heard him saying that shit. She went back and told Gary, and the next day they were gone, you know. But we had Deep Purple, Ted Nugent, Bad Company. No kid, good... Deep Purple opened up for Skinner? Oh, yeah, with, with uh, Steve Morris playing guitar with him. Wow. Steve Morris, you know, he you wanted to play that Skinner. Of Ricky Black, uh, Richie Blackmore? He was uh, gone? Yeah, he was gone. Steve Morris was playing guitar. That guy can play guitar. Oh, yeah. He's about the only guy that really imitated, uh, intimidated me. He he came, he came to, uh, he was going to play with Skinner for about three or four shows. He played Give Me Back My Bullets. So I had his guitar and I said, well, I'll string your guitar for you. And he's standing there and I strung it up. And I just, when I picked it up to see if it was in tune to play it a little bit, you know, to make sure it was in tune. I just about couldn't play in front of him because he's so good, <laughs> you know. But yeah. so I gave it to him and he played it. So he finished tuning it, or you tuned it at hand? Oh, I had it tuned. I just gave it to him to make sure it was right. You know, we had um, uh, Al Cooper came to the Universal Amphitheater to play with Leonard Skinner. And Al Cooper discovered Leonard Skinner, you know. Right. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he comes up to me, and he goes, hey, I brought a couple of guitars to use. I'm going to use this guitar. And he goes, uh, here, I think I'm going to use this black Stratocaster. And I said, okay, I'll, I'll string it up and get you in tune, and I'll, I'll plug it into an amp and shove you out on stage. He goes, yeah, yeah, Jimmy gave me that guitar. And I said, Jimmy Hendrix? And he goes, yeah, this is Jimmy Hendrix Black Strat. So I got to string it up and play it a little bit. In, uh, so Al him. Cooper played with Skinner? Yeah. Oh, be damned. Just on one song. He's a guest. And okay. I was in the Universal Amphitheater in Hollywood, California. He discovered them, you know. Oh, yeah, yeah. He produced I mean... their first album or two or whatever. You know, Skinner had always yeah. called a million dollars now. And, and Finocchio's. Did you ever go to Finocchio's? Uh, when I was in Atlanta. Yeah. A uh, couple times. It's just a bar to what me. What was Al Cooper like? Was he a pretty nice guy? He's, was he pretty he's nice? a nice guy. He's a little eccentric. But uh, we we did this, uh, Leonard Skinner, the Freebird, the movie at the Fox Theater in Atlanta. And I went there just to be a auxiliary guitar roadie, you know. Judy was putting the show on, so but she let me go uh, be a roadie. And we had we had guys from Gibson who was going to roadie the show, Gibson Guitars. And since 38 was going to be there and Skinner's were going to be there, I was going to take care of guitars because I used to work with 38 Special too. I was going to take care of all their guitars and help them out with the guitars backstage. And the first person to come in was Al Cooper because Al Cooper was going to introduce the band. And we were going to we had one day of production rehearsal. And Al Cooper came in and he went over and he goes, well, I'm going to play this mandolin and do a uh, Mississippi kid or, or Curtis Lowe. He was going to play something. And it's so funny. He picked up that mandolin and he started to play it. And he goes, 
well, this is totally useless. This mandolin's out of tune. And the Gibson guys didn't know who he was. They go, well, who's this guy think he is telling us this mandolin's out of tune? I, I went over. I said, Al, Al, I'll tune it up for you real quick. And I tuned it up for him real quick. And then they realized he was going to go out and start to show and be the, the master of ceremonies and introduce all this, the Skinner, wow. the movie. See, I, didn't all, know, I didn't know this. I didn't know Al Cooper, you know, got out there and played with him and stuff. Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, yeah, just, on, just on Mr. Breeze, he didn't play the Skinner songs. He just jammed on Mr. Breeze with him. Well, I guess Skinner, those those Skinner boys were his babies. You know, he discovered them, and uh, so oh, he he talks nothing but good things about Leonard Skinner. Like I was going to say, they called a million dollars an Al Cooper because they had to pay Al Cooper a million dollars to go away. You know, he was producing them, and they told him to get lost. Here's a million dollars. Why know? did they tell him to get lost? Because he was putting strings on Tuesdays Gone, and he was putting organ parts on. What's your name, little girl? Or he was doing things uh, when they weren't there on the music, and the band didn't like that. I think I'm not sure. I wasn't there, but well, let's um, talk about a little bit about. See, Craig was there when um, when uh, Dale and Alan and Gary were all there, and Gary and Alan got in a fight, and that ended the uh, the band, the Rossington Collins band. What? Where about were you in a tour when that happened, and how did you find out about all that? We were uh, we were at Alan's house. Yeah, I was going to say we were at Alan's house. So you oh, were you there too? I was probably out in the rehearsal room. I wasn't there when they were. Oh, so that you was late. The, at you night. weren't in the middle no, of the that, tour. This was that we were partying late at night when all this happened. There was so you no, weren't you no. weren't in the middle of a tour or anything. No, no, we no, were, we were working on an album or something. But no, we or, were just at home and and uh, you know partying. You got to remember that uh, Dale and Gary got married. Uh, what, <laughs> remember on the beach when Raymond and Dale got married? Not Raymond Watkins really. and Dale got married. I don't at the really at the remember turtle, at the Turtle Hotel. Sea Turtle Wind or something like that. The funniest thing about Gary, I mean, was uh, Raymond Watkins, our drum roadie, got married to Dale. And when they, when the preacher said, you may kiss the bride, Gary stuck his head right between him. And they both turned and kissed <laughs> Gary on the cheek, man. It was the stupidest thing I'd ever seen. Oh, I was really? like, what in the world is going on with these Leonard Skinner people? But anyway, <laughs> Gary and Dale, uh, Dale got divorced from Raymond, Raymond Watkins. We called him Wrong Way Raymond. Yeah, he, didn't he, way, isn't he the one way. that got shot? He got shot in the head by, yeah, him. by he his He was beating up some girl. He was smacking her around, and her boyfriend killed him. Oh, oh, really? Okay. And the other road, he took flowers, took a bullet shot to the himself head, with Ronnie self-inflicted. Yeah. And the other Skinner roadie, Ronnie Caruso, is in jail for 20 years. And so being a Skinner roadie can be – <laughs> well, they, yeah raymond and uh they they wanted a raise though and they they got fired according to what craig says you know they yeah. chuck and raymond did yeah with leonard well, skinner yeah. both those boys had drinking problems too but and that's their own problems you know <clears throat> and uh so whenever um oh, well, you gary, were gonna talk, we we're gonna talk about gary and dale yeah gary and gary dale were and dale. married Okay, Gary and Dale were married, and all the local girls in Jacksonville were saying that Dale was having an affair with Alan, and it got back, you know, it was just girl talk in town. Remember, Jacksonville, Florida, they all grew up there. They went to high school there. They got all their friends there, and all the bullshit comes when you're, all your high school friends, uh, you know, have a say in, right. you, know, uh, you know, I knew them when they weren't anybody. I need to come to the gig kind of mentality. And it was just a bunch of gossipy bullshit in the background going on. But Dale and uh, Gary were married. And, and you know, sure, they had, had arguments and fights and stuff. But Gary and Dale were sick of it, were sick of being sick of it. And they packed up and left and went out to Jackson Hole, Wyoming, and had babies, man. When they just wanted to be normal people. They, wanted they just to get took rid. a break, huh? It wasn't Alan. It was the whole Jacksonville 
all the bullshit from all the people in Jacksonville. They wanted to get away with it. And they went and got away and went and had babies. And it was better. It was good for them. That's the way I see it. Okay. Well, it's, it's, you know, it's what's kind of weird here is the perspectives. I get a perspective from Craig, which is the yeah. stoned perspective. Well, <laughs> he might've been and in the room when they were arguing, but, but yeah, I, was, I know, was there when they got in the fight. Yeah. They, had, they were right. fist fighting back uh, in the backyard at Allen's house. They were fist fighting. And then you got Mike Sparks here. Who's the, got the sober system perspective <laughs> which which is not you know i'm not saying craig's because craig's got you know he's got hey, oh i was of, high as i was high as cootie brown when that happened <laughs> but fist fighting was common i was fist, like uh, like fist fighting between everybody or who yeah there fist fighting i've seen fist fighting on stage <laughs> you know well, the funniest thing i heard was when paul abraham said that gary and uh when they did that when they had the <laughs> tribute band uh, Gary and Johnny were out in the hotel, out in the grass, fist fighting, and the sprinklers came on, and <laughs> and everybody was out there fist fighting. And I was like, man, these guys did a lot of fighting, you know? Very common, very very common fist fight. Just we're, even out on stage, huh? They just break into a fight. Craig was fighting with Ronnie Caruso on the bus one time. Craig was in his bunk, and Ronnie <laughs> came in all drunk, raising hell, and we had a drum ready. Dave Pennells and Ronnie was beating up on Dave Pennells and ripped his shirt off and Dave quit. This is on the bus. You know, we're on the road. So Dave quit. And Ronnie got, I mean, uh, Craig got up and said, Hey man, can you keep it down? I'm trying to sleep here. And Ronnie's like, screw you. And, and he slammed the door and broke the door off the hinges and hit Craig in the face. And Craig got up and started beating Ronnie's ass. <laughs> and I'm just sitting there in the front lounge of the bus. And he's got Ronnie down. I mean, uh, yeah, Ronnie Crusoe, he's got him down and he's, He's punching him in the face, <laughs> and Ronnie gets up and pours a beer on his face because he's sick. He was sick, and he was taking medication, and he, did, and he had snot blowing out of his nose, and he cut his nose so he had blood on his face, and he poured a beer on his face. And Craig was Craig was going to beat his ass a little bit more, but Craig said, I don't want to hit you because your face has got so much snot. And <laughs> he gave him a towel to clean his face off so he could punch him in the face again. <laughs> Because here, why you didn't want to get your fist off. beating your ass? <laughs> you didn't want to get and, snot on your fist, Craig, and, or what? And, and Ronnie, you know, Ronnie Caruso got his bags and left and went and caught a bus or an airplane and went home. And the next day, Gary and Allen get on our bus, <laughs> and I was sitting there and I didn't realize that I'd gotten cut on the face and I had blood on my jacket and and I was laughing the whole time. It was like entertainment, you know. <laughs> And it's like, man, I heard you had a fight on the bus. They want to come and get involved, you know. <laughs> and I'm going, I don't know. We, we were just having a good time. And they go, how would you get that cut on your face? You know, and, uh, they, you know, they always wanted to jump in and, and have a good time with a good fight. There, there are many fight stories with the Skinners. <laughs> you I know, heard Billy, I heard Billy was quite the asshole sometimes. Or he liked to fight too, huh? Billy's a tough guy. I wouldn't mess with Billy. Yeah, that's what I hear. And yeah. Randall is, you know. First time I met Randall, well, I met Randall, but first time I opened up his guitar case, you know, there's a 38 special in his guitar case. I'm going, what are you doing with a gun in your case? He goes, well, I'm playing bars around here, you know? And uh, he kept a he kept a pistol in his guitar case, which was like, well, that's cool, you know? Leon wasn't much of a fighter, but, you know, if he had to, he'd throw a beer bottle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, you know, there's so many, you know, the Paris, Paris, France fight was so funny. It was so just. Oh, do tell. Well, okay. We're in Paris, France. Well, well, first we're in London. Then we go to Paris. Then we go to Germany for like 10 days and play 10 shows. And we come back to Paris and we're in Paris, France. And there's like 5,000 people in, uh, in Paris, you know, they're kind of like, it's all guys. It's not hardly any chicks at the gig. It's mostly dudes, you know, and they're all hillbilly Parisians. I mean, they really are. They're like rockabilly, hillbilly Parisians. They think they're Southern rock crazy people. But, uh, and there wasn't much of a barricade. So the stagehands were in front of the stage and uh, it was Johnny's birthday. 
And he told the band, he goes, don't tell these guys it's my birthday. I don't want nobody singing happy birthday. I don't want a cake. I don't want nothing about being a birthday, right? And they start playing the set. And about the third or fourth song, Ed King, who we love so much. I mean, Ed's a great player. Ed plays between songs. Do, 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 do. Did he really? And that's all he played. <laughs> Five little notes. Just enough to aggravate. Enough to aggravate it, huh? Uh-huh. Johnny turns around and goes, you know, gives him the finger. Fuck you. And it's going, I don't need to take this shit from you. You know? And they start doing whiskey rock and roll or something like that. And they get to the lead break and Johnny turns around you know, and he's like, I'm going to kick your ass, motherfucker. And Ed's playing. He's like, you ain't going to do shit to me, blah, blah. Really? And Gary's like, what are you guys talking about? Kind of. Gary wants to go get in on it, right? And they're the blah, blah blah blah. They're back and forth. And in Europe, they don't have plastic bottles. They have glass. All the water bottles are glass, and the champagne bottles. Everything's glass. And they end that song, and they start playing the next song. And and Ed and <coughs> and uh, Ed Ed and, and Johnny. Hey, what happened here? And yeah, we're having a party. Are y'all still there? Yeah. Yeah. No, okay. Craig's Craig. Say, he jumps down when he's doing. Oh, I'm sorry. Like, yeah. Anyway, he, he slides Johnny, down. And Leon's like, what's going on over there? Johnny picks up a, a water bottle and throws it in a glass water bottle. Oh, man. You know, and it misses Ed's head by like an inch and it hits the amplifiers, you know, and it shatters. And there's so there's glass on the, on the ground. And they end that song. And they start to play the next song. And Johnny says, stop, stop, stop the song. Well, Billy and Randall had started playing the song, and they had to stop. So all of a sudden, Billy and Randall were pissed off because Johnny stopped the show. Johnny's fighting with Ed, you know. Randall, you know, he's like, what? what's going on with you guys? Gary picks up a champagne bottle and throws it at Ed. And Ed holds his guitar up and he hits his guitar, playing, and it spins around, and sprays champagne all over the friggin' stage. Okay. And they all start playing again and cuss the drummers, like, what's going on with you guys? You know? And I kind of walk out on stage and go, we well, all quit fucking around. I mean, you know, because I walk out on stage all the time, you know, doing guitar changes and stuff. And I was like, Stella, quit, 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 quit. So they, they, they get to Sweet Home, Alabama. They end the show. They walk off the stage as they're walking down the stairs, you know, somebody hits somebody in the back of the head and somebody pushes somebody down the stairs and they stumble down the stairs. This is the whole band is fighting against each other. They go in the dressing room. Johnny goes to hit Ed. He goes to hit Ed, like punch him in the face. And Ed puts his hand up like this. And Johnny hits his hand against his head. Broke Ed's finger. I'm talking about that finger. That oh, finger I, I remember the broken finger. He broke thing. that finger yeah. right there. Okay. Well, then they come back out on stage after they all had physically was fighting each other. Paul Abrahams was banging heads together to get him to go back on the stage. They come back out. Ed has to play Freebird without using his middle finger. They play Freebird and get off the stage. Ed goes to the emergency room, gets two pins put in his fingers. Damn. Because he broke it. And had it all wrapped up. And then we had to go to London the next day to finish the tour, you know. And the next day, everybody's got hangovers and they got black eyes and they've been punching each other. <laughs> but all because Ed went, happy birthday to you. He just started and some I, shit. And I think later that night, Ed actually had to beat Johnny's ass, <clears throat> uh, if I'm not mistaken. And there, there were other repercussions. In, in How London, the heck do you play guitar with pins in your finger? Oh, Ed King's no problem. He you don't use that finger. Did you ever see not to jump out of the out of the uh story or anything, but did you ever see much of Ed uh before he died? Because you were living near him, weren't you? Yeah, I saw him. I saw him here in Nashville. Yeah. I didn't go to his house, but uh, I saw him uh, at a couple guitar stores and uh, we went out and had barbecue one time. Yeah. And uh it's a, it was a great guy. I loved it. And uh, what a talented guy, huh? I mean, you know, he's just such a great musician. Very intelligent. Man. Very intelligent too. Yeah, he's the reason the tribute tour sounded so good. He made. I him. believe it. I believe it. No, yeah. we we sat at the practice house and played the records. We listened to the. They listened to the records. 
he said, this sounds like crap, you know, and everybody had to listen to the records and he made him, he made him play well. You know, we were rehearsing one time and we'd been off for like three or four months and we were down at the rehearsal place on A1A, which there's a thousand stories about that place. Oh, that, that, and, that was, that's where we did that getaway, that, uh, place, that rehearsal place. I was just there a year ago. Yeah. It was a, it was a cool, it was a cool place. They had it is a cool place. place. Yeah. Uh, that's where they, I built they, the 32 Plymouth down there. Oh, really? I had no idea all that shit was yeah, going. I mean, that, the Allman the Brothers. The place on A1A, yeah. There. yeah. We, we, I have we to get down. that film together of me building that car in the studio there. Yeah, we've been waiting on that car. We were, we were, we were, <laughs> and they, went down, they went down to rehearse, and, uh, and uh, it was Kurt Custer was kind of new, I guess. And uh, we, they played for a day or two. And Ed stopped. He goes, this sounds like shit. We got to get this together. It sounds like elephants are rumbling around in the low end. You know, the, the kick drum and the bass and the low end of the piano wasn't hooking together. But well, we know Billy and Leon know what they're doing. So it was Mr. Drummer had to get his shit together. So Ed made Kurt Custer, the drummer, and Leon, the bass player, play the set from start to finish. No guitars, no piano, no singing. And you know what Leon did? Okay, I'm ready. <laughs> and they played, you know, working for MCA. I ain't the one. I know a little. Saturday Night Special. Curtis, they played all the songs all the way through. Sweet Home Alabama. And played Freebird. And every time there was a clash, Ed make them stop and go, Kurt, your foot has got to be doing this. And then they'd play, and they'd play another song. He'd stop. Go, Kurt. They played the whole set. And then the next day they came in with Billy playing the piano, Leon playing the bass, and Kurt playing the drums. And then the next day they all played. And that's that's how good so Leon he's, was. So he squared them away one at a time, basically. Well, he was telling Kurt, you got to get it together if you're going to play right. the band. And what, was that after uh, – that had to be after Artemis got thrown thrown out off the stage there and – in uh canada huh well that's a whole other story you know artemis were you there for that <laughs> yeah yeah well, kurt... i gotta i want to hear your version of that one well we had we had two drummers we had you kurt know we Cus had kurt on here yeah we had two drummers and it was in toronto and i wasn't even the guitar ready we had dallas shoe was the guitar ready so i was at front of house as a stage manager dallas shoe the... is with you too he's been with yeah them. dallas he is uh, dallas is real cool He's the Edge's main man and has been for 30 years, man. Dallas is way cool as a guitar roadie. I yeah. thought I was better, but, you know, he was all right. <laughs> <laughs> no, we were in Toronto playing at that big amphitheater, and uh, it was like Ed told Artemis, he goes, look, uh, you play on the old songs, Kurt plays on the new songs, you know, and Kurt would, would play on the old songs, ba real basic, you know, but Artemis didn't learn the new songs on that 1991 album or whatever it was. So Artemis was just playing along and, and Ed was going, man, don't be playing along on those songs. It, it doesn't, it, it's a big mess with two kick drums doing different things. So uh, Artemis had an attitude and he showed up and, you know, he had his own bus and he had his entourage. I mean, he had his kids and he had friends and he had his own bus and, and he showed up at the gig with an attitude and they start playing the set and he was slamming the drums and he was overdoing it. And he was slamming the cymbals and between songs, he'd get up and walk around and sit down and do this and that. And they started playing one of the songs and Artemis picked up a tambourine, two tambourines and he smashed them together and he broke the tambourines. He was hitting them so hard that the pieces of the tambourines, we're flying all over the place and, and a piece of tambourine hit Dale in the face, oh, you know, shit. and Gary turned around and goes, what are you, what are you doing? And Dale's like rubbing her face from getting hit in the face with a piece of a broken tambourine. And Gary turned around and said, Hey, you dumb mother, you know, blah, blah, blah. And Artemis said, I don't need to take crap from you. And he pointed to Ed and he said, this mother Ed King, screw him. And they started playing another song and he started hitting his drum so hard. He was like breaking drum heads. And he knocked over his cymbal and he did this. And he, you know, he was throwing a tantrum on the stage. 
And Gary looked over at me and Craig and uh, Big Lou and Paul Abraham and said, get him out of here. And we just walked up on the stage, about four or five of us. And, uh, uh, you know, I can remember going to Artemis, hey, man, you need to calm down. They want you to get off the stage. And he looked at me and he said, fuck you, about 10 times in a row. Right? Point his finger yeah, right at my your, nose. Your old, his you, old Marine buddy. Yeah. Fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. I mean, he's a, you're the one he brought in. Yeah, I know. But I was a stage manager, so. <laughs> but you had to do your job. Yeah, stage manager's in charge. Yeah. And uh, we all got around him, got made him walk off the stage, got him off the stage, because Kirk had finished the well, show. Let me ask you this, <laughs> uh, Mike. Oh, because, you know, he's still pissed off about that, I think. And have you talked to him? What happens is when I see Artemis, I haven't seen him in a long time, I remind him of Leonard Skinner. And when he had his troubles, you know what I'm talking about. He had trouble. Uh, right, yeah. He had I real know. trouble. Yeah. He was in, he was in jail and he was going to go to Rayford prison for 20 years as a child molester or he was going to take a plea and get probation. And he felt like nobody from Leonard Skinner came to help him. Nobody came to jail. Did, did they? Not that I know of. I was working with 38 Special. I was out of town all the time. Nobody came. Nobody. He had his problems. So, Nobody so wanted he's to be got a grudge over that then. Well, nobody much. came to help him. Yeah. And he had to take a plea agreement. He had to confess and he had to go to counseling. He had to say he did. I don't yeah, think if he, he did if he if he didn't do it, if if he didn't take that plea, he'd still be in jail. You know, at that time, I was surfing a lot. And I'd drive out to the beach and he lived at the beach. And you don't park your car at the beach because all the locals will break into your car and screw it up because they know you're out surfing. If you got a surf rack, you know, they know you're out in the water. They beat up your car, your locals only. But anyway, I could park at Artemis's house about a block and a half, two blocks from the beach and walk down and surf. And I'd come back and I'd be at Artemis's house. And he always had band members or whatever band he was in living with him. And he had his sons living with him. And, you know, when you live at the beach and your kids get on the patio, it's like take your bathing suits off and you spray the kids with a hose and they go in the house. Yeah, right. It's just kid stuff. Yeah. They turn that into ch child molestation. They said that, that was him getting his jollies. He was trying to keep the sand out of his house. And, yes, his youngest daughter, two years old, was molested by somebody. They flashed her. But, you know, his wife at the time, she thought she was marrying a rock star. She had to go work. So she, you know, she'd be at the laundromat and it'd be babysitting. And she'd call up somebody she didn't know and have to take the kids over to a babysitter. It could have happened there. It could have been one of those band people that are hanging around his house. It could have been anybody who was in and out of that house all the time. And they were asking her questions like, who taught you to pee? Did your daddy teach you how to pee? And a kid would go, yeah, my daddy taught me how to pee. You know, once again, that's child molestation. You were showing your kids how to pee, spraying them off with a, you know, it turned into just a witch hunt. And they told his, I'm sure they told his uh, wife, you know, we're going to take your kids away from you if you don't testify against him. You know, he was railroaded and nobody came yeah. to help. And that's he pretty was sad. Sitting in, sitting in jail. Waiting for 20 years in Rayford prison as a child molester. Do you think you want to go do that? Yeah. You'd, that's, be, you'd be bitter too, man. Yeah, you nope. can see you can see why he's got that attitude. Nobody yeah. could help him. I mean, Gary and he thought Gary and Alan would hire lawyers to come and get him. And I don't think nobody could have helped him. So that if attitude was, that he had in Toronto, though, was that just because Ed was pissing him off? And well, and, it was about his you can't play when Kurt it, can you imagine being the drummer in Skinner and all of a sudden going to bring another drummer in to make an album? Well, because wasn't it to help because his, his he couldn't play it too long because of his leg was jacked no. up or no? It was a personality clash with Ed. Oh, okay. Artemis is Mr. Hippy Dippy, okay? You know, Artemis is Hippy Dippy. Peace, love, dove, you know, even though he was a Marine, Ed is Mr. Hacker. We call him Hacker because he, he had a computer, 
he's Mr. Straight Ahead, Straight Arrow, Straight, even though he might have been drinking and drugging, but, you know, they had total personality clash. And Ed wanted another drummer because Artemis was a hippy dippy, I guess. I don't I wonder know. Wonder if they were doing any of that during the original scanner. You know, I wonder if that was a problem or just did it just over time, did they just start getting on each other? I, yeah, I don't, I think with Ronnie in charge, uh, there was never going to be any of that. Yeah. Because Ronnie was in charge. I got to say one thing. You know, I got with the band guys uh, after the plane crash and uh, they never once, so I can remember, mentioned Ronnie Van Zandt. They didn't mention him. They didn't talk about it. I think they were afraid they would raise him from the dead if they talked about him. Oh, really? They yeah. never, I think they were still scared of him. That's my opinion. They didn't talk about Dean very much either. You know, so it might just be me reading into it. But I felt like they didn't want to raise Ronnie from the dead. And the only time they mentioned Ronnie would be Artemis going, if Ronnie was here, he'd be kicking your ass. You know, that's the only time I heard Ronnie's name mentioned. You know, JoJo would bring him up, but as far as the core of the band, they they never they never mentioned him. Yeah, and I never I, did. I never heard Gary and Alan ever talk about Ronnie. No, yeah, no. Uh -uh. Even you, Craig, wouldn't. You know, I, I thought y'all. I kind of thought y'all were afraid of raising him from the dead. You were afraid he would come back from the dead. No, was, I, I used to I used to tell Gary that uh, I, you know what I thought Ronnie would think about the things that were happening, and he didn't appreciate it. Yeah, he didn't. They didn't want to hear about about Ronnie at all. You know, this might take a minute to to figure out, but you know, I didn't meet the band until uh, 1979, maybe 78, 79 is when I actually met the band and started working for them in 80 and all that but you know i met ronnie van zant in 1971 and i didn't realize it until 19 like 87 i was i was driving with gary and uh brian evers and we were going over to johnny's house and i don't know what, why what year was, what year was this mike this was in 1987 or 88 i was driving gary and Brian Evers, uh, one of our guitar roadie buddies who worked for Johnny Van Zandt, and he was a guitar roadie for Skinner. He was Gary, uh, Johnny's cousin. Brian yeah, and, Evers, yeah, and he was stage manager for Johnny Van Zandt, man. And he was mm -hmm. a good guy, man, super good guy, still a good guy. Yeah. And he, he was a stage manager for Leonard Skinner for many years. You know? <laughs> for a long time, yeah, he just gave Yeah, up. for like 15 years, as yeah. long as I was doing it. Anyway, we're in the car on the west side of Jacksonville, and we're driving by the baseball diamond, and Gary goes, hey, that's where Ronnie hit the ball and hit me and Bob, hit Bob in the head. He goes, right here is the baseball diamond. And I go, yeah, I know the story. He goes, yeah, we were right here. And uh, after he hit Bob, he said, he said, we jumped in Ronnie's car and uh, we're going to go over to Bob's and rehearse. And he goes, yeah, we were in the green pig. And I said, the green pig. And he goes, yeah, Ronnie's car, we call it the green pig. There was a green pig barbecue and the base, the softball team was called the green pigs and Ronnie's car was like a 65 green Mustang and they call it the green pig. And I said, <laughs> Gary, why do you call it the green pig? And he goes, well, you had to be in it. He goes, the floorboards were rusted out. There were no carpeting on it. Springs were sticking through the seats. There were no upholstery on the doors. You know, you could see where you rolled the window up and down. And the dashboard was all cracked and it was just totally tore up. You know, it was like destroyed from the beach because the beach would eat a car. You know, the beach really, the salt yeah. water would tear your car up. Right. And that second, I remembered I was in Jacksonville, Florida when I was in the Marines, 1971. I was going to school at the uh, Naval Air Station. I was going to a, what's called a C school, the letter C, A, B, C, a C school on a piece of equipment. And you spend two weeks there and you learn the equipment. Then you go back to your squadron, which is up in South Carolina. But I took a bus from, from uh, the air station, took a bus to downtown Jacksonville, and I wanted to go out to the beach. And the next bus going out there for 50 cents was like a, it took another hour. So I went down to the Main Street Bridge and I was hitchhiking. 
I was going to hitchhike out to the beach. And this car picked me up. Don't okay. tell me that Ronnie Van Zant picked you this up. This guy with long blonde hair picks me up. And I remember the car because it was so dilapidated inside. It was tore up, <laughs> springs through the seat, Good no upholstery, God. dashboard fucked up. We start driving out <laughs> to the beach. He goes, I'm going out to Mayport, okay? He said, I live out in Mayport. I'm going out to Mayport. So I'm riding with him. And we're talking about cream and almond brothers and he goes yeah i'm in a band i got some good guitar player boys and i said yeah i play the guitar you know and i'm talking to this guy about bands and music and we yeah. drive out to mayport which is three miles from the beach and he gets off at the exit and i jump out of the car i said hey man thanks for the ride and he takes off and i don't realize it until daggone 58 years, until 88 when gary Shook my brain and I said, How frick did I've you tell Gary this. that? Did you tell Gary that story? I don't think I told hardly anybody that. But I met Van Zant in 71, but I didn't meet the band until 78. And then I didn't realize it until 88 when Gary, you know, told me about because I didn't know about the green pig. I didn't know about the interior of it. I didn't well, know you anything. got you got to meet Ronnie. Yeah, imagine that. That is so. That's a cool. Story, and that was before man. they had a record deal. They were playing the comic book club or something. And uh, I went out to the beach and ran around. Went back to the base, but and I never thought twice about that until he said the interior of that car was the worst interior. And I remember the worst interior I'd ever seen and in the it, car. It was a green Mustang in Jacksonville, Florida. I'll be damned. <laughs> So, that's anyway. that's just too much of a coincidence to be a coincidence. Well, that, yeah, that's, that's, it, it, it really is. That's, that, that's, you know, that's bizarre. That's the way Leonard Skinner is, though. Oh, it, yeah. it is. Everything it about is. Skinner is mystical and weird. Yeah. That's and, the same way this podcast goes, doesn't it, Craig? Yeah. I mean, you had same to, you, you know, shit. you met Artemis in the Marines, and then that story comes up, and then you've worked, you've been associated with Skinner for. For almost as many years as I have. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but you taught me how to be a Skinner, get Craig. <laughs> well, well, Mike, let's go. Let's move on over to the uh, Alan Collins band. Let's jump into the Alan Collins band. What was that? How how was that like? Was that like a an organized mess there or what? It was. It was an unorganized unorganized mess. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Uh, Alan's theme song was Rev on the Red Line. Oh, or, really? Uh, or Bad Company. Uh, Johnny was a blue blur. Dun, 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 dun. I'm just going to say this. Um, uh, uh, Alan's funeral, you know, we had Alan's funeral and everything. And the night after Alan's funeral, we were all in an apartment, Gary and Dale and Leon. And I don't know if Craig was there. Craig might have been there. And uh, they called up... Uh, they called up a radio station and said, Hey man, will you play shooting star for Alan Collins? Cause that was, that's a song about Alan really. Yeah. yeah shooting star. If you're familiar uh, with the bad company song, yeah. I well, found, the radio uh, in the apartment didn't work. So we all ran down and there's like 10 people inside this car in the parking lot, listening to the radio and they played shooting star for us, you know, and that's just the way the scared stuff was. But Alan was rev on the red line, Alan Collins band, you know, uh, we were rehearsing in Alan's garage, and I had a, a PD board that I ran the drums into for monitors, you know, for the rehearsal. We had monitors, and we had one board for the drums, and I'd mix them down and put one input into the mixing board. Then we had the vocals, vocals, guitar, bass, and all that kind of stuff. And Alan had a TAC uh, 4410 tape machine, so we had a, a tape recorder. And the thing about that machine was you could sync in time. Most tape recorders had a delay. You couldn't you couldn't sync right in time. But this was a sync machine. And uh, they would play, and I would record them and record them and record them. And they would play, and I'd record it. Well, they took that tape and sent it to Tom Dowd. And Tom Dowd listened to it and said, well, I'll come and make a tape. So Tom Dowd, famous Tom Dowd, you know who I'm talking about? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Producer. Uh -huh. Right. The Wonder Kid. Yeah. In his, when he was young, he was the Wonder Kid. We knew him as the old guy. He came down and he took all this rudimentary junk equipment, these old PD boards and this TAC machine. He made a tape and went and got a record deal for Alan Collins' band. He convinced a record company 
But he came to Jacksonville and spent two days there. And I was shoulder to shoulder with him, telling him how I had it laid out. And, you know, and he didn't care. It was junk equipment. He made it happen. Because I heard that album would have gone platinum if he could have toured behind it. Well, what happened was when you put an album out, they make 75,000 copies. And if you sell those 75,000 copies, they up it up to make 100,000. And if you can sell a certain percentage of those, they'll make more and you can get tour support and go out. Well, they didn't sell enough. Uh, the first 75,000. So they didn't get any tour support. I thought support. he got paralyzed and that. Well, that, that was later. That was a little bit later. But uh, well, Alan he quit Man, touring. We quit. We, uh, we put the album out and we did six shows and he quit. To, he, he walked off stage and that just, and, and that ended it. Yeah, yeah, you guys only did like five venues, didn't you? Or six, five? I think we six? did six. Yeah. And what yeah, happened that night? All over the place. What happened that, that night? Was mostly done. just down in Florida. We I we went down in to and did uh, uh, some of them uh, p- 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 during spring break, wasn't it? We did the, yeah, we did we did we did the brass trail in Daytona or something like that. Then we went oh, down. I to Fort, remember the brass Fort trail. Lauderdale. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Remember, remember the guy in the in the alley. There's a skinny little guy, and we had two bodybuilders loading the truck. And this guy was yelling at him, going, you all a bunch of punks, man. And they're going, <laughs> we're going to kick your ass. And he'd go, oh, I'm sorry, man. And he was, just a, he, he was just a drunk in the alley who wanted to get his ass kicked or something. It was so, so funny. I'm sorry, man. Then he'd start talking shit again. And he'd go, I'm sorry. It was so funny. But Alan, Alan Collins, man, we, we got it together, and we went up to – Studio One and made a record up there. That's where 38 Special Made Records and Atlanta Rhythm Section. Yeah, a lot of people. And, that, that was supposed to be a great place. And uh, yeah, it was a good enough studio. So you you went to all of those great places, the yeah. recording studios. Yeah. I uh, man, I was playing pinball at Studio One. There's a pinball machine, and Jeff Carlisi had the record from 38 Special. And I was in there playing, and nobody was in there, and nobody was bugging me. And I was going to break the record. I was in the zone. I was right on this. And right then, I think Leon and Billy came walking. Hey, man, what are you doing? Pat me on the back and stuff. And the ball dropped. And I barely didn't make the record. After playing one game for like a half hour, it was like, <laughs> you guys. You, but, you uh, beat him, huh? You beat Carlisi? No, barely. I didn't. You did because, beat him? Because they came in. That's when the that's – when the, we were making that album when uh, when somebody was poisoning people on Tylenol. Remember when that Tylenol? Oh, I killed? remember that. Yeah, oh, we were. Yeah. That Damn. was when we were making that album. I, I remember sitting in, you know, watching the news while the band's in there playing. I remember that really clear. But that was uh, like a big thing on the news, you know. But you know, the Alan Collins' band. You know, Alan was totally, totally out of control. Well, he yeah. had so much shit happen to him by then, you know. I mean, he was, well, he, he, you know, after Kathy died, then Gary <laughs> left, and uh, and we were trying to carry on, and uh, we went and did these gigs, and uh, you know, we did a gig out in Texas, I think it was, and it rained, and there were but twenty people out there, and Alan was like, he's like, if those people are going to stand in the rain, I'm going to play, and we went out and played, and I was walking on stage with a two by four pushing water out of the ceiling because it was it was like a waterfall on a drum set, you know, and it was just a junk gig. And we went out to Houston and we're all ready to go and we cancel the gig and we come back from the gig and Craig and I have to drive all the way back to Jacksonville at three or four o'clock in the morning and we get off the freeway on the west side and it was so disheartening to have to back up to the practice house and back up and unload the truck. And it was just, uh, this thing's over with, you know, it was just a super drag. And the reason we quit was because Larkin, you know, Larkin said, hey, we can't lose any more money. So I thought it was something happened in, in New Jersey and that guy got up on stage to sing and Alan didn't. Didn't like him. Uh, yeah, every gig was like that. Somebody wanted to get yeah. up and be Ronnie Van Zandt. It, it wasn't that. It, it wasn't that the the last. No, Alan it was because said, we weren't making this. We weren't making any money, and Alan couldn't afford to to pay everybody. I mean, when you got six guys in a band, a couple of roadies, 
you know, paychecks are every week, man. And all of a sudden, yeah. I'm not. Well, he can't, he couldn't just pay everybody and not make any money coming in. You know what I mean? And I, that's a business decision. Let's talk about the story when um, they they uh, found. I guess is maybe it was Larkin found out that Kathy had died, and then uh, somebody had to tell him. And, yeah, uh, and was, talk about that some there. Okay, we were at, we were in Norman, Oklahoma. That's a college town. Oklahoma's, you know, Oklahoma's there, and we're playing a regular old gig. And Larkin was there. Alan's dad was there at the gig. And we're doing the, the Ross and Collins thing. It's going good, you know. What the heck? We're playing a show. And uh, he came over and told Craig that Kathy Collins had died. And it's like, what? Hmm. And he told me, Kathy Collins died. You know, she, Kathy was pregnant. She was at the movie theater yes. with her daughters and her sister. She went in the bathroom, started bleeding. Passed out, laid on the floor there, and bled to death. Orange Park Cinema. Imagine Which the that. crazy thing was, Judy Van Zant was there when it happened. She might have been there. Yeah, she was. Yeah. Anyway, her daughter went in to see what's taking her so long and found her laying on the floor, and here she had died. So we're at the gig. We're playing the gig. He tells us, and we're kind of like, do we stop the show? Do we not stop the show? Let's just let's wait till the show's over. So they play the show. Then they go off stage, and we're kind of trying to avoid Alan. Then they come back up and do Freebird, you know, same old show. And uh, he rocks out on the Freebird, but he's looking over at Craig going, what's wrong? Because we got grief on our faces. We don't realize it. We're kind of like, we're not smiling best. You know, I used to yeah. smile. And he was best all show ever. Craig said it he was be all better, happy. Yeah. You know. That's your job is to go, this is the greatest gig ever. Boy, we're having such a good time. And we weren't doing that, you know. And Alan's like, what's wrong with you guys? You know, and he's playing and he's playing the fast part of Freebird. And uh, when he gets done with it, he takes his Explorer off and throws it on the floor. You know, he didn't wait for me to come out and get it. He didn't throw it to me, which he did occasionally. He took it off and threw it on the floor and and run over to the edge of the stage and jumped off the stage and ran down to the dressing rooms. And I have to put the guitars up, put them over in the guitar world, turn the amplifiers off and all that stuff. And Larkin comes over and he goes, I want you to come with us. So I went with Larkin and I went down and uh, we went outside and got in a limousine. And then Gary and Alan got in. So it was Gary, Alan, me and Larkin get in a limousine. And I'm sitting there like... This is kind of weird. I need to be loading out, you know. And Larkin wanted me to fly home with him. The promoter had gotten a Learjet, and the airport was right next to the venue. You know, this is kind of a small town, college town. So the airport's right here, and we're right here. And uh, Alan goes, what are you doing in the in the limo? And I look at Larkin, and I said, he wanted me to come with y'all. And Larkin turned to Alan and said, Kathy's died. And just, Mark, you know, he Alan just threw was, it out there, huh? He just threw it out. And, and Alan, and what, Gary and what was, was the look on his face? Well, very stunned, very like, what the fuck are you talking about? Are you crazy? What are you talking? You know, it's kind of like that. And he told her, he said she was, she had a, a miscarriage and she hemorrhaged and she's, she has died, you know? And Alan was like a pinball flipping around a pinball machine going crazy. And Gary was, distraught as much as you know because he he didn't know it and we next thing you know we're pulling up to a learjet and we get off and we we're walking up on the learjet and alan's like what are you talking about why are we getting on this plane kind of thing we get on the plane they close the door it takes off learjets are flying like thirty five thousand feet they fly higher than uh, commercial airliners they're flying way up there you know and you can see the stars and all this did, could you see the curvature of the earth? No, I don't think we were, it was at night. <laughs> it was like, just, sorry about that. One o'clock in the morning. But, uh, well, the, the stars were more prominent when you're higher, you know. Right, and, uh, yeah. It's like, oh, man, this sucks big time. And they were drinking whiskey. All three of them were drinking whiskey. And Alan was freaking out. He And Alan was trying was to he, open. Was he starting to realize it now? He was trying to open the door to the airplane, okay? Damn. 
He was going to jump out of the airplane. Pulling Ronnie's old trick. It wasn't a trick, man. He was going to jump out of the damn airplane. He wasn't going to throw somebody out. He was going to. And me and Gary were trying to keep him from it. You know, Mark is going to settle down, you know, and we're kind of wrestling on him. And he'd settle down for a couple minutes and they'd jump up and try to get out of the airplane again. And that was like that all the way back to Jacksonville. Man. We get to Jacksonville. We go over to Allen's house. Is it uh, is it all of you guys went? You, Gary, Larkin? Me, Gary, and, and Larkin. Yeah. Just the four of us. And we go over to his house and, and Kathy's sister's there and his daughters are there and some family members are there and Alan's freaking out and he's hugging his daughters and he wants to get them in the car and take them somewhere and then he doesn't want to and then he's drinking and then he wanted to go to the uh, funeral home. He goes to Kathy. So we jump in the car, we go to the funeral home, beat on the door, call up a guy, get a guy to show him Kathy's body, you know, at the funeral wow, home. Wow, no way, really. Yeah. Then we go back to the house and uh, he had a record player that would play uh, one song. If you just wanted to repeat, it would just repeat one song, his record player. You didn't have to listen to the whole album. Kind of like computerized or something? No, no. This is before computer, but it was special. So you could just play one song over and over again. And he put I, Tuesdays Gone. I remember Go that, yeah. I know. He put Tuesdays Gone on. And it and would play just Tuesdays Gone. And it played Tuesdays Gone. And we listened to Tuesdays Gone for about eight hours straight. How fitting, though. That's the song. Because Tuesday you... is Kathy's Tuesday. Yeah, In that's case just she didn't crazy. Know. No, I mean, I yeah, I'd heard that. Yeah. Well, and what, what happened was the Hell House, they used to get broken into. So they all had to spend a night there. And Alan would stay there Tuesday night. And Kathy would go out there and bring him an RC and a moon pot. I don't know if you know this. The Skinner's called RC's MERS, M-U-R-L, a mer. They go, hey, give me a mer. And I think mer was a guy who used to drink RC's all the time when they were growing up, when they were teenagers. Oh, they, they, Gary used to say that mer came from when you drink RC, the, the gas in it. You drink yeah. it, and you'd go, er, mer. Like yeah. You'd, you'd kind of burp. They'd call them mers. Yeah. So mer, anyway. Mer, mer. Yeah. Kathy would bring a myrrh and a moon pie out to Alan and <laughs> on, Tuesday with him on, Tuesday, on Tuesday nights. And Ronnie went out there one time, like on a Wednesday morning, I guess. And Alan was on the porch playing some chords. And he goes, what's that? And he goes, oh, man, it's this song I'm working on. He goes, he goes, Kathy left me. You know, we had a fight and we broke up. We we're never getting together again. This is high school. And, oh, shit. Uh, and he start, he's playing the chords to Tuesday's Gone. It's a waltz, you know. And uh, he said he said he was sitting there playing the chords. And uh, there's a train track right right next to the hell. Right, house, yeah, there's a, tre a trestle right there and everything. And yeah. uh, he, said, uh, he said, I was playing those chords. He said, like, you know, in an hour, Ronnie hadn't written. Train roll on, my baby's gone, gone with the wind. Tuesday's gone with See, the wind. I had heard that it was about her, but I didn't know the specifics of that's how. That's why she's Tuesday, because she used to go out on Tuesdays, and Alan had to watch the hell out of See, that, that's a Stone Roadie exclusive right there. Yeah. But uh, so he played that song like for eight hours straight. And uh, I was telling my wife, you know, you'll be in like Dillard's, you'll be at the mall, or you'll be somewhere. And you hear that. And you'll hear it way in the background it's playing. You know, and for me, it's like, it takes me right to Alan's house, you know, with yeah, Alan. I bet. But uh, finally, all the band guys got there the next day and a half. You know, they had, they took a bus from Oklahoma. And Craig showed up and everybody, showed, Dale showed up. And we're all hanging at Alan's house, having a wake, I guess you'd call it. Everybody was there all the time. And finally, the next day, Dale said, man, I got to get out of here. And... <laughs> And I had eaten a, a gram of hash, a hunk of hash. Really? You know, Do you get a buzz that way? T t tell me about it. I ate a gram of hash <laughs> the night before, and I fell asleep, and I woke up. And I told her, I said, hey, I can't drive right now. I said, I'm so groggy and goofed up. Uh, it took me like an hour before I could drive her over to the – she wanted to go work out and go home and take a shower and all that stuff. But uh, – well, one time we were in San Francisco, man. <laughs> we had these sound guys that brought, had hash oil brownies. 
in past Britain, memory. Britain Palmer Buswell the yeah, third. Yes, he had those hash owl fudgies. That's the guy. That's oh the guy. my God! Yeah. I held my hand out and I took. I, I and, had one of them, and I took my other hand out and I got another one, and I ate two of them, man. And I couldn't hardly walk. We were laughing at street signs and. We were laughing at the <laughs> any the fence posts going by. Oh, the those bus. things were easy. And, and Craig easy. says he has brain damage, and he pulls that name right off the top of his he, out of his guy, ass. Britton Palmer yeah. Buswell the third. The guy would talk to you, and he'd go every time we talked about dope, he'd go like this. Oh yeah, man, we could touch sticky bud, and we. Would, <laughs> I think he ended up committing suicide, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, he's dead. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, Palmer Buswell the third. I remember that. But yeah. uh, anyway, I had a, I gave Dale a ride uh, away from Alan's house, and it was it was hard to disengage from that, you know, because you kind of wanted to stick around. And after and about three days it. of it, though, man, it was like we, we got to do something else, you know. You what was he? What was he doing the whole time? He kept playing eight hours of Tuesdays Gone. Was he just sitting there, just listening, or was he drinking was he... and shooting his gun off and trying to? Trying to leave and go on a walk in the yard and come back out and shoot his gun off and drink whiskey and you he know, would he shoot was, his gun in the neighborhood and nobody had called the police out the back door. Yeah, he knew he, all the neighbors. He shot his car one time. He he bought a little '56 red Mercedes for for Amy, his daughter, and he shot a bush. He thought it was a person out there and it shot the door of the car. You know, I heard about that one. I had, you know, I had to quit hanging around with Alan after uh, a lot of people had to. And that's what well, um, I was in his garage with him and he had a Mac 10 machine gun pistol. Oh, I remember those. Mac I said, 10s. Hey man, you gotta be careful with that. And he went, Oh, this ain't shit. And he shot a full automatic. He shot about eight rounds. Pow, 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 pow. And they were just flying. You know, I'm standing next to him. And after that, I said, man, I can't come over here anymore. Yeah, that's what Sally Arnold said that she just, he, and I asked Craig because she said he shot and it just missed Craig. And Craig said, Oh, it wasn't that close. And I said, How No, far it was that it? was me. I remember the yeah. thing. We were, I was on the back porch and he came out with that gun and shot it, but it wasn't at me. She was there. I remember it. Yeah. You know, yeah, he was, it got to where it was like, you know, somebody's drinking a lot of whiskey and doing other things. And then machine guns. It's like uh, I don't think I can come around here anymore. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. And I mean, it was right. It was after that. Right after that is when he had his car wreck. I can see why he had that car wreck. I mean, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think he was driving. I uh, no. And uh, Steve Reynolds. I don't know if you remember if you ever met him, but he yeah he said that he no he wasn't driving. Well, Craig Craig has been with Alan in a car, and I've been driving Alan in a car. If you're driving. You're fighting Alan. Yeah, because he's, he's trying to stomp the gas and everything, huh? He will stomp the gas, and he will grab the wheel. So you stop. have got – you're in the Alan Collins club or riding in the car with Alan Collins. You're in the club. That's that's like a – Yeah, but I'm in the club, club with Craig Reed too, though. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God, yeah. He's ridden with me to the airport. I was, oh in, the, I was God, in the back yeah. of the van – with him and Ronnie Caruso and Ronnie Caruso was like, whoa, wh what's wrong? Cause I, I had to wake Craig up to drive to the airport. Right. And, uh, and I, I said, I'm getting in the back, Ronnie, you can have the, the seat. So Ronnie goes, all right, cool. He gets in the seat and Ron and Craig takes off. The reason I got in the back was so I can put the luggage around me for the accident we were going to have. And I'd be padded. Uh, he still does that because I was, we were in, and somewhere in Ohio, Cleveland, I think we were. And Craig's <laughs> hauling ass down the road doing 90 something. And I said, Craig, there's a cop back there. And he goes, Oh, really? And I go, Yeah. And there's weed smoke in the car. And thank God the, the, the freaking cop wasn't after us because he flew by us. Oh, we should be dead from the cars. You know, I, I drove, uh, uh, Leon had a, uh, had one of those super birds. Something oh, yeah, right. yeah, those super birds. Yeah. And uh, I was driving that thing as fast as fast. I was going like 100 miles an hour, and I came to a dead man's curb. And it's, you know, it's on that back road going over to the practice house on A1A. And it is a truly a 45 degree angle dead man's curb. And I had to cut way down on the inside 
on a blind corner just to make the curve because I didn't realize it was there, you know. And if anybody was coming, we'd be dead, man. And one time I was driving the band van with Ronnie Caruso, and uh, the, the uh, front brakes didn't work in it. And I, I flew over some railroad tracks, and I put on the brakes, and it was like there was no brakes. And I went through the stop sign and went through four lanes of A1A right across the road. Thank yeah, God lucky. nobody killed us. You know, we you know we were at the rehearsal house. And we were talking about on A1A. <laughs> I don't think we have a name for that place. But Craig was out there in a go kart one day. He had, oh, he had yeah. a go kart, okay. <laughs> and the driveway, you drove in one way and you drove to the front of the place, and then you drove out the driveway and the other thing. So Craig had a, had a little whiskey in him, you know, and he doesn't have a shirt on. He probably doesn't have shoes on, and he's driving this go kart. And he drives down the driveway and he would pull on the A1A, which is a main road, state road, and haul ass in this go-kart down the road and turn into the end of the driveway and then drive through the driveway, kicking up gravel and wiggling and doing, you know, having a good old time and go down well, to the end of the driveway and pull out on the A1A and haul ass down the road. <laughs> and here he comes around again. He's doing two or three laps. And then all of a sudden, Highway Patrol pulls in. <laughs> <laughs> pulls him over in a go-kart was no that shirt. like a just a briggs and stratton motor or something well, i think what it was, was a little it? more than that it yeah was hauling ass. but it was a go-kart but it was hauling ass so the cops <laughs> like you got your license no you, you don't have insurance why are you driving this on the road you've been you drinking been, have you been drinking, you've been drinking. <laughs> <laughs> so he's breaking all the laws but the, the cop was cool because of leonard skinnard Mr. Craig Reed did not get in trouble. He's like, keep the go kart <laughs> off the road. I think, I think that happened with him and Alan on the way down to Miami too. They had that hot <laughs> that hot rod, and those cops were big car buffs, and they said, "Oh, no, we cool. were in the thirty nine Buick." Yeah, yeah, and they and they and they had everything you could think of in that drugs and drink and. and I had cops. a I drove Alan down there. We had Alan's lazy boy in the back of the van for the studio. We took his lazy boy down there so he could sit in the studio on his lazy boy. But I drove back and forth with Alan. And one time we were driving back and we were in St. Augustine and I, I pulled over to get gas or something. And I got my bag and I said, Alan, I'm out of here. I'm not doing this with you. Cause he was trying to kill me, you know, pushing my leg, trying to go faster. So, past that so cop car. you were in the car when he would do the whole thing with the pushing the pedal and all that, huh? 10 times, man. <laughs> Why did he do that, man? <laughs> I don't know. It's usually going to the liquor store. <laughs> I'm sorry. Go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt. You had a oh, story. I was I was going to say at, at, at the practice house on A1A one day, the band's in there rehearsing and uh, you can't, you can't sit in the office because it's too loud. So we all sat around outside and we had a long phone cord. So we had a phone outside so you could use the phone, but you'd have to sit out front. Okay, and uh, we had bows and arrows and BB guns and BB <laughs> pistols and all kinds of stuff for goofing around when the band wasn't rehearsing. You know, they take a break and go out and play around. Get your mind off the music for a minute. You know, <coughs> when you're writing music, it's obsessive compulsive in your head. You got to get away from it for a minute. So yeah. Kurt Custer, Mr. Kurt Custer, grabs one of the BB pistols and he runs out front and we're all standing out front taking a break and there's probably 10 people, you know, with a band and a couple of roadies and a road manager. And Kurt runs out there with a pistol and he's hot. He's running behind the trees and he's acting like he's a secret agent, man. And he's shooting the pistol at us and he runs over to another tree and he crosses down and he's shooting and he runs over to another tree and he's crouching down like he's shooting at us. Right. And everyone's all laughing and he's, he's acting the fool, you know, like right. he's a TV show or something. Well, the band goes back in, and starts rehearsing and uh so they're in there playing and me and craig and i think in that and big lou uh and, and tim little tim smith is out there and all of a sudden i think it was lou he goes man there's some cops out here and we all go to the door and look outside and the cops were in the end of the driveway behind their doors with their guns out pointing at the doorway so Lou goes out and goes, hey, man, what's going on? And here comes another cop car, and here comes the highway patrol. And there's like four or five cop cars pull out, and they got their guns out. 
pointing yes. at us. They saw and Kurt sneaking around with that gun. Somebody driving by saw him with a gun and, and called the cops. Wow. Because it's right on the road right there. Oh, yeah. And he's just playing around. They thought somebody was out there shooting. So they call the cops, and the cops pull up with their guns out. And we all have to go outside with our hands up, talking to the cops and telling them, no, hey, man, this is Leonard Skinner. We're rehearsing. We were just fooling around. It's a BB gun, blah, blah. They go, well, we got to go in and check out what's going on. And we're like, oh, man, are they smoking dope? You know, yeah, it could have been what's right going on in here. You know, we go, okay, come on. We go in, stop the band, everybody. Let's go outside, let the cops. So, luckily, nothing <laughs> was going on. They all snoop around, they look around, they see what's going on. They're like, hey, sorry, we had to do this. You know, somebody called in about a gun. That's a perfect Leonard Skinner thing, I'm a, right there. I'm gonna have to send old uh, Kurt. Uh, a damn uh, message and and say, hey man, <laughs> Kurt. Uh, so I, I I remember a story. I hear somebody tell me a story about you with a gun down there in the BB studio. gun. I had yeah, forgot yeah. that story. I forgot all gun. about that. And yeah, then, I remember that now. Then the band goes in to rehearse, and we're all sitting there, you know, around the telephone. And about half hour later, a cop pulls in and pulls down. He goes, "Hey man, can I use your telephone?" <laughs> He wanted to call his office and talk about something. He had seen the phone sitting out there. And we said, yeah, man, you can use this phone all you want. So all of a sudden, the word's out. Leonard Skinner's there. The cops know we're there. The cops are our buddies. That's why Craig Reed didn't go to jail for drinking and driving on A1A. <laughs> well, everybody likes Skinner music. You know, the cops. Kurt, Kurt Custer, right? Kurt was a great guy. And he, was, he could be as wide open as anybody. And we did these shows where uh, I had a roadie for a day. In other words, the radio would have a contest and a person would win to be the roadie for a day. So I'm on this tour and I'm the stage manager. And every day they would bring me a roadie for the day. So I'd get a guy <laughs> or I'd get a couple. I'd get a little kid with his mom. Every day it was different. Well, I'd get two, <laughs> two couples dressed up. They're a roadie for a day. And I'd show them where the trucks and the buses were unloaded, and here's Guitar World, and here's the lights, and here's the sound, and blah, 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 blah. And they hang around with me all day. Then about 4 or 5 o'clock, I'd give them their tickets and their passes, and really front row seats and stuff, and, and say, hey, here you go. You're at the gig. You can go sit out front. And I swear about half the time, they go, hey, man, can we just hang with you? You know, Guitar <laughs> World, which is right next to the stage. I go, no, you can't hang there. So we were like in Irvine, California, it's Shoreline Amphitheater, somewhere like that. And I'm talking to this nice couple, roadie for the day, you know, and, and uh, they were just a regular old dude and his girlfriend. And and we had a good time all day. They got to eat lunch, you know, with the crew and uh, saw all the, all the backstage roadie stuff. And I'm standing there, and all of a sudden, the, the door to the dressing room flies open. It was like a trailer. And Kurt Custer comes out, and he's got a pair of, of bell-bottom jeans on, no shirt, no shoes, swinging his hair around, and he blows some snot rockets out of his nose. You know, he just walks out, blows the, snow, blows the snot rockets, stumbles back into the trailer, and I go, there's your drummer. We'll go over and meet him in a minute. <laughs> you know, but that was their introduction to the... Did he know they were out there? He didn't care. No, he no, just... he was, you know, this is the middle of a tour, and he was hung over from the night before or continuing right. the party. Yeah from the night before we had man we had a guy one time we were i forget where the heck it was up in boston or somewhere we had this fan when the show was over he jumped up he got up on the stage and he went over to the lighting world and uh the lighting guy that jerk i forget his name uh lighting guy had left his lanyard hanging there and the guy took the lanyard and put it on and it says all access you know, so here a punter gets off, gets out of the crowd, gets on the stage, gets a lantern that says all access. So we're tearing shit down. We're doing this and we're doing that, you know, and uh, this guy's walking around, walking around. And uh, he saw me put the guitar straps away in a case and I push it over. And when I'm done with the case, you push it over, you push it over, you push it over. I'm doing other things. So he went over and got in the guitar case and took a couple straps. Well, then he went down to the dressing room 
And he went down in the dressing room and started taking leather jackets and coats. And, Damn. and he, had a whole, he had a whole armful of all this junk he was going to take. And he went out and he was trying to leave. And somebody caught him and stopped him and took him to the production office. And I think Ed, uh, Craig, Hobson. what was his name? Hobson. Ed Hobson was the production manager. And Ed's a good guy. You know, Ed wasn't always on the case, but we got the job done. <laughs> Ed would show up at five o'clock for the load in, okay, five in the afternoon for the load in, but he was there for the loadout. And so they got this guy in the production office, and Bobby Lindley or somebody, it was his past. Bob, that he was a jerk, lighting guy. Anyway, Ed's in there yelling at him for leaving his past laying around and got his past back, and he got all the shit back from the guy. And it was like a Bowie knife that was in the dressing room case, too. He had stolen all this stuff. And we're all in there, three or four or five of us. And we're like, well, let's beat this guy's ass, you know. And Ed was like, no, we're not going to do anything to this guy. We're not calling the cops. We got all of our stuff back. We're not going to do anything. So Ed calls him a cab or, or Ed makes somebody give him a ride. He had to leave the venue, right? Or it made him, took him to the gate and made him leave, okay? And we're like, oh, wait, I kicked that guy's ass, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> So we get on the bus, we leave the venue, we go down the road, and we stop at a stuff store. We stop at a convenience store, and I get off the bus. I think I was the first guy off the bus. And I get off the bus, and I look over, and the guy is at a pay phone. <laughs> and I get back on the bus, I go, hey, everybody, that jerk's out here on the pay phone. And everybody runs off the bus and runs over to him, and he's, like, on the phone, like, these guys are going to beat my ass right here in the parking <laughs> yeah. lot at a convenience <laughs> store. And we, we fucked with him for a while, but uh, once again, Ed wouldn't let us do what we wanted to do to him, but he went, he was trying to steal everything, man. Yeah. He what was, a jerk. Man. Yeah. Car blanche, man. He was taking everything. Anyway, that's goofy ass Leonard Skinner story right there. <laughs> yeah. You know, I tell you what, man, I, I I've heard Craig, talk about mike sparks and you know I, man if we could get mike sparks on but he you know craig he doesn't like to bug people you know about coming on well and, I, uh, I asked mikey before and mike's got a business he started and i asked him i guess it's been a couple years now yeah and the other day i get people that ask me guitar questions all the time i go god i don't remember about amps or stuff i go get a hold of mike sparks he knows and then and then the other day somebody made a comment about mike sparks and i said hey man people have been asking about you you think you could come on the show he goes yeah man i'll do it so that's uh but yeah, we it's all it's all good people you know people ask me all the time about leonard skinner guitars and they're real exacting man they know more than i know just about yeah, they're, they're free <laughs> but uh, man. what what happens i get on facebook and i get on these leonard skinner things and people are so full of shit you know, I try to set them straight, and and then I get frustrated, and I get off the Leonard Skinner for a while because I get tired of talking about it, thinking about it, because I'm not I'm not involved in it. But uh, uh, just a whole whole bunch of great memories, and uh, like I said, a lot of these people know more about the gear than I know about the gear, and uh, because well, they go back to the old Skinner gear. Well, there's and, something uh, cool that has. And, Something cool. There's something cool surrounding you that has nothing to do with Leonard Skinner that we got to talk about. That uh, well, it's, I, it's I, actually amazing. You know? I got my Leonard Skinner ring on right here. What, <laughs> tell us about that. Well, this is sterling silver. We played it when we were in Germany. The Germany, promoter yeah. uh, made these rings. It says Germany 1989. You, or you something. got one, Craig? I, I, you know, I did have one, but I sold it. <laughs> right there. I, Somebody I, offered me a bunch of money for it. What's it okay. say? What's it got something written scribed on it? It's oh, just got Leonard Skinner on it, and then it's got a gold piece in the middle. Yeah, yeah. that's oh, with the what? initials of the promoter, I think, are on that. And then it says Germany, 1989, and it has a little hallmark, German yeah. silvers. Uh, yeah, it's cool. Did yeah, everybody got one? I guess so. Band you know, and crew, just a band and crew. Yeah, band and crew. Lou Greg, had a handful Greg, of them. He he brought them in the dressing room. He said, "Hey, everybody, get one of these." But then I was to, tempted to take. How two. did you get the thing to fit? What's I that? I mean, it's how did you got lucky it fit? 
I mean, it's not like, well, there was a bunch of them and you just picked up and found one that fit. Yeah. Okay. You know, at the, you know, about the same time we were playing with bad company and Mick Ralph, their guitar player, he made Zippo lighters. It had bad company on one side and Leonard Skinner on the other side. Yeah. 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 And he gave everybody one of those. Boy, that was pretty cool. those things still got to be around somewhere. I lost mine somewhere. I don't know, even know where it is. I well, sold let's, mine. Let's, <laughs> let's talk about that damn declaration of independence. We got to talk about that thing, man. Okay. You, the, the, the uh, subscribers, this is like some kind of a lottery thing. This freaking Mike sparks here, man. Tell them the story about that, Mike. Well, you know, uh, uh, after working for Skinner, I worked for 38 Special, and uh, then I worked for the Confederate Railroad. Then I went back to Skinner for a couple of years. Then I went back to the Confederate Railroad as a country band out of Chattanooga. And then I worked for Lone Star and Hank Williams. I went to Japan with Hank Williams Jr. That was pretty cool. Mr. Hank Williams uh, Jr. But uh, And I loved working for Hank. It was cool. It was, it was really cool. And uh, anyway, I started working in Nashville. I live in Nashville. And I worked at a place called Soundcheck, and it's where bands rehearse. And there's about, uh, we had about six big rehearsal halls, and they have about 200 lockers where all the bands keep all their gear. When they're not on the road, they keep it at Soundcheck. And, you know, Jack White, uh, Keith Urban, uh, Vince Gill, everybody keeps all their guitars and amps and stuff there. And all the little bands, all the big bands, it doesn't matter. It's all the same. But I was uh, doing cartage. And that means I drive a truck, 14-foot truck, all around town every single day, taking the studio guys' equipment uh, to the studios. You set it up. They play a three-hour session. It's a union thing. They sign a union card. You tear their gear down. You take it back to their locker. They call up every day. Hey, I got a session tomorrow at Treasure Island. It's a three-hour session. You know, it starts at 10. And uh, we had about 20 of the top clients. Anyway, I was doing cartage. So I was working at night and on the way to work, I would stop at a thrift store because that's my hobby is going to junk stores. And I look for sterling, silver, copper, bronze. I like the metal stuff, but I like anything that's interesting. I'll buy anything that's interesting for a couple bucks. And I was in a Music City thrift store going to work. And I bought a copy of the Declaration of Independence, which was just laying on the table there. And it was, you know, it's pretty common in thrift stores, little brown crinkly paper it's souvenirs from Washington. This thing was like two and a half feet wide and about three and a half feet long. It was big. And when I unrolled it, it was like a work of art. It was an engraving. It wasn't a print. It was an engraving. And it was on parchment, which is lambskin. It's not paper. It's leather, lambskin. And uh, I took it up to the counter because it did not have a price on it. And they said, okay, well, Small posters are 99 cents and big movie posters are $2 and 48 cents. So they sold it to me for $2 and 48 cents. Did you well, haggle on them? What's that? No Did haggle. haggle? Man. No. <laughs> and I showed it to a couple of buddies of mine. I took it home. You know, I tried to do research. I went over to a book dealer over here and I went over here and I went to the, the state archives and I went to a lady who, who deals in documents and she couldn't tell me anything about it. And finally, I had never been on the internet. This is 2007. Uh, I got on the internet and I Googled up uh, a guy's name was on it, William Stone. And in about 10 minutes, I had the whole story. This was what's called a Stone Declaration from 1823. There were 200 of them printed up. Congress passed a resolution declaring those 200 copies official declarations of independence, not original. There's one original. There were 200 official declarations, and they in the resolution, they said uh, how they shall be distributed, two to each state, two to each territory, two to each department of the government. There were only six departments of the government, two to the Supreme Court, two to the president, two to the vice president. And there was 100 left over for the dis, uh, president to give them out to colleges and universities at his discretion. So he passed them out to whoever he wanted to colleges and universities. So there's 200 copies floating around from 1823, official Declaration of Independence. That's what I found. So after doing the research on it, I found out one had sold for $200,000 10 years earlier. So I knew what it was and I knew what it was worth. And I got with an auction house and he had me uh, 
take it to a conservator, and they did preliminary conservation on I spent five thousand dollars <laughs> getting it all fixed up because people who buy something for two hundred fifty thousand dollars want it looking pretty good. And we put it up for auction, and one year later, I sold it for four hundred seventy-seven thousand dollars. It cost the right. people who bought it sixty-seven thousand dollars in commissions. I paid fifty-eight thousand dollars to the auction house. I paid one hundred fifteen thousand dollars in taxes, and I ended up with two hundred fifty thousand dollars at the end of the day. And that was what year? Two thousand seven, two thousand eight. That that's a house. That's, that's a, why I sold it. <laughs> that's well, a house if, right there. If, yeah. I, I, had, I asked Mikey about it well, years ago, and he said, yeah, I bought a house, and I bought a car, and went back to work. <laughs> yeah, I bought, I bought a used car. I bought two <laughs> he used bought cars. a Mercedes uh, 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 SL. SL 500. Yeah. Well, I wore that thing out, man. You know what that was, Mike? That was Ronnie Van Zandt and that damn Mustang, and he was and he was remembering you in that car. And he said, "You know what? That guy put up with a lot of shit from these guys, and you I'm know, gonna shit on him." I'm so <laughs> glad. I'm so glad you mentioned that because you know Ronnie bought uh, Craig a Mercedes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and he would brag to Thirty Eight Special. He goes, "My roadies are so special." They drive Mercedes. <laughs> yeah. You know? He said, yeah. Don, he said, Donnie, even my roadies drive Mercedes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I, I heard that story and I thought I'm going to work so hard. These guys are going to buy me a Mercedes. And you know what? <laughs> they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you, yeah, but you, you were able to get one though. Just, I mean, shit, yeah, I did. Man. nothing it happens cool. by accident. I don't think, you know, you, you, uh, probably, somehow deserve that i'd say well if you're not gonna find what you're looking for unless you're looking okay i was that's for, for sure i didn't that know what it was sure. but you know because of that I've, I've been on three tlc shows you know like instant fortune or i found a fortune or instant millionaire you know those tlc you know, I think I saw that one time and I was sitting there eating some popcorn and I said, look at this lucky son of a bitch. <laughs> and, then, uh, and, and then I was on a, a game show called To Tell the Truth, you know, where you stand up. Oh, there really? You were on yeah. there? Well, yeah. I was. I go, oh, I, I was discovered the declaration. And the I watched that. Me. Yeah. And the thing was, nobody voted for me. And the guys who I was on with, I gave them all the figures about the taxes and the money and stuff. So they could answer all the questions, you know, uh -huh. cause that's all people care about was the money. Uh -huh. And, uh, and you know, that, that was pretty much that. And the reason I went on there is because I used to watch that show with my mother. When I used to watch that. Too. Yeah. And I got to call my mom and go, Hey, I'm going to be on to tell the truth. And it was so cool. <laughs> that she got That's to great. Up. Is that, can you still find that on the internet? You think? Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's still on. Yeah. Yeah. They make it's you pay for it. Or whatever. It was yeah. a network show and they make you pay for network shows. I mean, it's only $3 or something. I, I would like to see that though. But I get, I get a check. You say it. TMC is TMZ you're on or uh, T the learning channel. Oh, the learning channel. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, TMZ are, wasn't around then, 2000. Oh, man, that, that was really – one of them was really cool. Uh, the scenario was, you know, they, they said, oh, you, what did you buy? And I said, I bought a couple of guitars and a couple of cars, you know, and this and that. And uh, so they called up Carter Vintage Guitar in Nashville, Tennessee, and to okay us to go film in there, okay? Carter's Vintage, vintage Guitars. So I went down to Carter's and checked it out. And they had one, Ed King was selling one of his guitars in their consignment shop. It was $22,000, 54 Les Paul. Ed King was selling it in this, in this shop, okay? And I told the, the TV production guys, I said, hey, let's go to the guitar store and I'll, I'll act like I'm buying Ed's guitar. You know, so <laughs> what they did, they, they showed me at home playing my guitars. They had me leaving the house, driving my car, my Mercedes, down to the guitar shop and they film me three <laughs> times getting out of my car and walking in the door and walking in the door from the inside. And I got with Walter Carter, a, Carter's guitar. He's a really cool guy, really good guy. And uh, we started walking around his guitar store and we started with the acoustic guitars where we're walking around. We go to the amps and we go to the electric guitars. But as we're walking along, I'm talking to Walter and he realizes I know about guitars. 
because I was making jokes about guitar. Now, he don't realize you knew Ed King. Well, no, well, he did. He did, but he thought I was just a punter. But uh, he went, and we got to the like the amplifiers, and I go, "Hey, man, you got a Dumbo amplifier?" And he goes, "Yeah, that's that's two hundred fifty thousand dollars." And I said, "I knew what that was," and I said. I said, how's come that amp's worth $250,000? He goes, well, that's Stevie Ray Vaughan's amplifier he recorded his first two albums with that he got from David Lindley, who was in Jackson Brown's band. You know, I kind of set him up to, to pitch oh, okay. that album. Right. And then we went over to the basses and we went over to the electric guitars and I went mm -hmm. to a gold top and I said, you know, I want a gold top like that. I said, I don't want a new one. I want an old one. He goes, I got one in the consignment room. So we walk in the consignment room and we were looking at guitars and I go, Man, this is what I want right here. And it was Ed King's guitar, right? And I said, I'll tell you what. I said, Walter, I'm going to buy this guitar, $22,000. Do you take a check? <laughs> he said, yeah, for you I will. <laughs> and that was the end of the segment, right? And then they went on, how can this guy afford a $22,000 guitar? Yeah, he found the Declaration of Independence. Then they went into the Declaration story. <laughs> so it was a setup, you know, yeah. for the Declaration because, like I said, people just care about the money part of it. And uh, mm. but later on, I had to text Ed. Uh, I said, Ed, I did not buy your twenty two thousand dollars. Did he see? Did he? <laughs> no matter what you show? see on TV, you know. Did he that, see it? It was a fun little joke, you know. Thing. You you think he saw that show or later did on? Did he? Yeah. Not that day, but I texted. Did, him. did you ever run across unknown Henson? Uh, no, but I've seen his videos with Ed. Yeah, was, well, wait, a, let me boy. let me break in. That well, remember when Ed? Did you see the thing with Ed when they they did the moonshine thing and and Ed said, "I did not just I don't own a club on in Nashville. I did not just buy twenty two thousand dollars worth of homemade rum and and uh, and uh, no, it, it it's a." It's a um, reality show, <laughs> you know. So, you yeah. know, did you see that with Ed? No, I didn't see on that. Moonshiners, on I Moonshiners, I still haven't seen oh, that. I didn't see yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He acted like he was buying sixty-five thousand dollars with a moonshine <laughs> for a club he owned in Nashville, and he That's had. Funny. I, was, I I don't drink. I don't own a club in Nashville, and I didn't just buy sixty five thousand dollars. A moonshine. A moonshine. <laughs> it's a reality show. Yeah. Yeah, I, I saw a video. Um, it, it, Killer B. Killer B. Set him up with that, and Killer B. Still does that moonshiner show. Does he? Yeah, the comedian Killer B. Yeah, he 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 was out with Skinner. You remember? Yeah, when he Killer was out with Skinner when. I think it was when Greg Martin was filling in with Ed for Ed when he broke his Yeah, finger. Greg was a good guy, man. Yeah, yeah. When Ed had his broken finger from the Paris fight. Yeah, 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 yeah. Greg Martin filled it. Well, you know, we're we're running like two and a half hours here, Craig, so we probably uh, – I'm glad we were able to get all these – which yeah I'm it's sure been uh, it's been interesting i'm i'm glad you uh i thought we were about to wrap it up and then you and then you brought it up about the uh, uh declaration of independence oh, we had I, for, to tell I forgot i forgot all about that and that was about <laughs> yeah. an hour ago <laughs> yeah well i mean <laughs> like that uh, you know but yeah this has been a good one yeah this for, is the, people for are going people to really like that, this one. that watch the uh podcast that that to I'll just tell you right now, they're going to love this one because oh, yeah. it's just chock full of everything that they want to hear. And like the Tuesday's gone story, you know, and then the fact that you were with Alan whenever he tried to jump out of the plane and then you were there that, and then, like I said, a lot of these stories that we heard from Craig, that's the stoned version and which it's, it's a good version yeah, mikey but, mikey did, did never drank alcohol yeah he but, smoked some but weed there's a little more clarity drank. to it now you, you know, know you know he had to put up he had to put up with me snorting whiskey and drinking cocaine yeah it, 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 we would do a show and, and then people would ask me 
questions about Skinner. They'd find out I was with the original Skinner, and they'd start asking me, wanting to tell Skinner stories, and they'd be filling my nose with cocaine. And uh, I would end up, Mikey would have to round up stagehands to put all the equipment together because I was jibber jabbering with the, the, the fame. Oh, yeah, I was going to say, occasionally, <laughs> occasionally, Craig would go, you handle it, I'm out of here. <laughs> and, and you know we we had done it so much that you know when you got stage hands you go you four guys do this you four guys do this you four guys do this. you could really get a lot done quick you know and uh, it can be done but uh Man. Remember, remember in New York City, those stagehand guys were yelling at the women. They were going, "Hey, baby, how'd your butt get?" Oh so man, big? that was at the Ritz, man. That was so <laughs> funny. Why's your butt so big, baby? <laughs> they were screaming at it and at, at these women on the street. Hey, baby, how'd your butt get so that big? How'd like your that. butt get so big? Well, we had like me some... and Mikey were laughing. We had the semi truck. It was right on the street, and we had to unload and carry it up the stairs in the Ritz uh, Club. It was a big ballroom club, and uh, the girls would come up and give the stagehands shit too, man. Um, they, a bunch of them wouldn't take it. They go, "You small dick, mud, blah blah blah." <laughs> and it was it was all fun. It was total New York City on the street. It was. Were, so, just were so you fun. around Alan when he would go up to some gal at the bar and go, "Hey, give me some of that putty. I know you got some of it on you." <laughs> many times, many times. Craig, Craig, were you out in front of the wrist when that girl went out there and her bike, her motorcycle got knocked over? I don't remember that. We were standing out front, and there was a really nice chopper out front, but it, somebody knocked it over. And all of a sudden, this girl comes out of the bar wearing all leather and stuff, and she goes, motherfucker, who knocked over my bike? <laughs> and she went over and picked that thing up, jumped on it, and started up and roared off into the night, man. And it was like, <laughs> man, it was it was so, so New York. It was just New York. So, so Mike, the whole reason that you're – Basically, that you were involved with Leonard Skinner had to do with Artemis Pyle, right? I mean, if it, yep. weren't, for, if it weren't for Artemis, you'd have never had all those experiences. And, and you were in the Marines with Artemis Pyle, and look what it led to. Man, you got like a, you but, had a colorful life. You know, I wasn't tied down, and I didn't need money. I mean, I, if the wind blew that way, I could go that way. Yeah, you know, which is... You I know, was living I mean, on my Volkswagen van. And, uh, but, you know. but here you were in the military and you're in Jacksonville and doing some training and then you need a ride somewhere and hitchhiking and, and uh, yeah. And right at the main freaking, street bridge, if you Ronnie know Van Zant picks you up and then <laughs> fast forward, you know, you, you didn't get to be around him much, but you damn sure got to be around that band he put together. Huh? Oh yeah. Hey man, I love playing Curtis Low. <laughs> Oh, I sit here and play my guitar, man. I was playing whiskey, rock and roll, or Curtis Lowe. I love playing Curtis Lowe. Well, I tell you, a lot of people are going to love it. There's going to be 300 comments on this one. Um, uh, we appreciate you coming on. You know, we're going to have to wrap it up uh, but because I'll be up all night editing, you know, which there's not much to edit, but I got to – it's all the whole, you know how when you download stuff, it takes forever. But Well, I figured we, you, could make, you could make a couple shows. Yeah. Yeah. But people get pissed off when you do that. Sometimes, you know, they like to hear the whole thing. It's just like I went out and did the Steve Gaines birthday thing and, uh, out in Miami, Oklahoma, and it was a little over two hours. And, and I decided I just could keep it in one because hey, hey, so, Craig. So, sometimes we do something, we don't get monetized yeah. and, you know, and, and we're hoping we get monetized on this one. Yeah. Did, did Craig tell you about the, the story about the fight in London? No, uh, I think he did. Yeah, when but Artemis, Artemis not a, started. Not, I haven't heard a sober version of it. You know, you know, when I got with Leonard Skinner, I was the new guy, so I got to hear all the stories, and I got to hear the stories multiple times from multiple people. So I kind of yeah, got. We, we need the sober version. I, I got I got all the <laughs> stories, but at the same time, they were all doing depositions about the plane crash, so they were going over their stories. You know. Like when I met Craig, you know, he had a sore ankle and a sore wrist and he'd had all of his ribs broken and he was 
had been unconscious for a couple of weeks. That's it's his head injury. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Brain damage. You know, when yeah. I met everybody, they were still pretty broken. You know, Leon couldn't even play when I first met everybody. And uh, Gary was sore, you know, but uh, yeah, I, I can't believe it. You know, with Alan with his broken neck and broken head and broken arm and broken the whole side of his body bruised up, you know, but when I'm Alan's arm, uh, Alan's arm looked a mess. I mean, that was his left arm, and his right I mean, side. His was, arm looked a mess, man. But uh, you could I, see. I got, I got all the stories. You know, I got the fight story from when Ronnie got his ass kicked on the by the Chicano gang in L.A. And they came, the, they came the next day to collect money for the shirts they ripped, beating him up. You know, <laughs> they came to the gig the next day wanting money because they ripped their shirts, beating him up. Really. Over, <laughs> Or the the fight in London, but I, I I got all the stories from everybody individually. So you know, Billy told the story, his part of the story. He started the fight in London in an elevator, you know, and Artemis was in the middle of it with the with the cops, you know, the English Bobby Boxing Association, and then Craig and Alan and Gary walks in at the end of the fight and gets their butts beat. Except Craig <laughs> decided not to participate. In the ass whooping, <laughs> he stood off to the side. I said, "You guys don't want to get involved in this. This is, uh, you know, you got." Artemis, Artemis was getting his butt yeah. beat. For what that he did. must be why Craig's still around because he's got some <laughs> sense about him. You know, occasionally they went running into it, and I went, "You guys don't do not want to get involved." But they didn't listen, and Alan got popped and took off running. But Gary got his ass beat. Gary's got that big scar it was on his cheek for you know, rest of his life. But uh, well, hey, we'll do this again, guys. Yeah, well, that would be great. Yeah, I know you're not. You're probably not even a third of the way through everything that you've got. <laughs> you, uh, you, you bring out the memories. I can tell you that. Yeah. Well, we appreciate you coming on, and uh, you know, Mike Sparks, man, this was uh, really great, and and you know, the fact that you told us that story about meeting Ronnie, that that kind of capped it off for me. I really love that, man. That that's was, a, hey, that's a typical Leonard Skinner that, thing. Yeah, and the stuff like that Leonard happens. Skinner. It happens to Craig and I all the time. As a matter of fact, you coming on here was kind of weird because, uh, you know, Craig, was, we, we were talking about, you know, we had lost somebody that uh, Freddie Salem died and we were going to have him on. And then, and then Craig was like, damn, man. You know, we, we, we had that all set up. He goes, I think I'm going to send Mike Sparks uh, a message and see if we can get him because, you know, it kind of let the air out of our sail when that happened. And, and, but yeah. now you kind of made that. up for it. Yeah. You kind of made up for it. So we, we appreciate it. And, um, yeah, uh, we're going to have uh, a lot of questions on the next podcast. People probably, uh, want to continue to talk about it. So all that's... right, well text me or whatever you want to do. Yeah, I yeah. bet I bet there's a lot of people gonna have a lot of questions for you. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, this seems like this was all just meant to be. We've 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 had two really we that our last two shows we had a Griff Martin on the road and then Kathy Godsey had a good good human interest story a couple of weeks ago with the guy in the wheelchair that we pulled up on stage. Mm -hmm. People enjoyed that and God, this one is as 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 the uh, top of those two by far, as far as I'm. Oh yeah, I, but, I'm, uh, I'm telling you. Yeah. Hey, you yeah, know, I was going I was gonna say about the Confederate flag. Remember the big controversy about Skinner and Confederate flag. Oh yeah, you know, yeah. You know, and Gary Gary made the decision not to do it, and I can probably guarantee ninety nine point nine percent it's because of his daughters. He don't care about what people say. He doesn't care about all the BS from the fans and all that. If his daughters are young girls who are not woke, but, you know, just young people who have a different perspective, if he heard that from them, he said, yeah, baby, I'll take that flag down. Yeah, that's, kind the, of that's the only person probably. he's got to answer yeah. to, is his wife and his kids. You know, because yeah. there's so many people say so much about Skinner and the Confederate flag. And, yeah, and I'm glad you came in on and told the uh, your version of the story about Artemis because yeah, yeah, neither one of us, both of us, know that Artemis, you know, didn't do that. He was railroaded, but uh, yeah, it's good for our 
audience to hear that. That was that's real good. Yeah, you know, Department of Children's Services, man. If they get their claws into you, it's over with, man. Yeah, there's it's not fair at all. Yeah, we were gonna have his daughter Pepper on, and she was gonna basically clear his name and something. And I guess Artemis, he went to the uh, to her wedding, and he talked her out of coming on. But I kind of wish she would have. Maybe yeah, she, still she will, had her baby. She had her baby here. Uh, last week and it was very premature really yeah um well, and uh i guess it's you know the doctors can uh, can make it make it happen man they can help those little ones it's very premature it's just bigger than your hand like it's real and, and you know I, I was talking to uh craig and uh, i realized that leonard skinner the corporation of leonard skinner is run by women you know judy has a big part of it Dale has four sevenths of it, you know, and like I was telling him, uh, Karina and uh, and Amy Collins, and that's the four people that own Leonard Skinner. And if uh, if Dale, bro I mean, if uh, Judy bought out Amy, it just means it's it's women who are actually running Leonard Skinner. For all you fans out there, you yeah, know, there you uh, have Johnny it. really doesn't run Leonard Skinner or Ricky Medlock or any of that. You know, right, and that's why that's why Craig didn't get in uh, loud in there because you know <laughs> there wasn't the guys in the band. Yeah, that they, that they, they, there's a thing going where Leonard that they're not allowed to play Leonard Skinner music at a Trump rally because they're. Uh, well, that that's you know when you buy licensing for the songs, certain bands can specify that their songs can't be used. You have to specify no political affiliations. So that's why you use them and then people get pissed off and they want to change because, you know, when you buy BMI songs, man, you get all of them or ASCAP songs, unless it's real specific that uh, is written in there. They, they can't be used for political reasons. But, you know, there's a million songs out there. <laughs> and, and a politician should be using don't ask me no questions. I'll tell you no lies. Right, <laughs> right. Yeah, you know, well, the 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 tribute band song "Red, White, and Blue" would be a good uh, good political song. Yeah, there, but they're not allowed to use it either. So, all right, we'll just wrap it up, and we'll we'll do a continuation of this. I'm sure. Yeah. Well. Okay. And so we're gonna call this a wrap, and uh, see you later at the alligator at the wild crocodile, and happy trails to you until we meet again. And we're out of <laughs> here. Cut. Thank you, Mikey. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, guys. Happy trails to you Until we meet again Happy trails to you Keep token until then